for just about three whole years now. Monster Hunter Rise has been the dominant power in the franchise. An experimental, action-oriented, fast-paced, and over-the-top entry into the legendary series that has pushed Monster Hunter to be bigger, faster, nuttier, and more stylish than it had ever been before, whilst locked to the confines of the Nintendo Switch. It's honestly pretty remarkable what this game is capable of doing, despite the handicaps of the device it was predominantly built for. I think experimental is a word of choice that best describes Rise as a Monster Hunter title. Even with World taking into consideration, Rise brought in one of the largest onslaughts of new ideas, changes, gimmicks, mechanics, and gameplay alterations that I think Monster Hunter has ever seen. Rise brought with it a shotgun blast of new and zany ideas, and as is the case for even the most well-aimed of shotguns, even a solid hit like Monster Hunter Rise is going to have its share of small pellets fly off the mark. Rise is the title of some undeniable controversy, whose wide range of new ideas, fresh inclusions, and exclusions has made it a topic of debate since its inception. The goal of this video is to dive into this title that I have loved genuinely for the last two and a half years and offered a love letter for the excitement and fun it has provided me. But to truly love something is to acknowledge its faults. And though I certainly do not count myself amongst those who dislike the game, this video absolutely touches on the issues I have with Rise. Because, well, that feels a little bit more genuine to me. And though I do aim to point out my compliments and my criticisms with the game as evenly as possible, I still see this video as a labor of love rather than an obligation to pure objectivity. Thus, this isn't my Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak review, but instead my celebration of it. I think the best way to start this video off properly is to give a bit of a thesis statement on my personal opinion of Monster Hunter Rise. A kind of blanketing opinion to contextualize everything I say after this segment, to keep clear at all times what my true opinion on the game is. Monster Hunter Rise is a great game. A fun game. I have genuinely enjoyed just about every one of the seven to eight hundred hours of playtime I have with it. I'm happy that this game exists within Monster Hunter's long line of games. Simultaneously, it is perhaps the Monster Hunter game I am the most ready to move on from, and I will be very happy if it is the only Monster Hunter game quite like itself. That last sentence may sound like a bit of a backhanded compliment, and it kind of is, but it also kind of isn't. Let me explain. One of Monster Hunter's greatest strengths is its explorative, forward-moving, and adaptable nature, and its willingness to try new things. Couple that together with the fact that more than one of these titles is usually being worked on at the same time, and what you wind up getting is a franchise that never disappears for too long, whilst rarely ever getting stale. Every title feels special in its own way. Every game has its own identity and leaves its own mark. Having a legacy that persists into its successors, whilst the succeeding titles themselves seek to do their own thing. Monster Hunter Rise, I think, pushed this adaptive and experimental DNA that Monster Hunter has to its limits in a few places, for better and for worse for its own sake. But here's the thing, although Rise will inevitably have some form of legacy going forward, there will only be one Monster Hunter Rise, much the same as there is only one Monster Hunter Try, one Monster Hunter Frontier, one Monster Hunter World, etc. My point is that the ever-shifting nature of Monster Hunter as a series is what makes me like Rise more and softens some of its decisions that I didn't love. Rise is just Rise, not quite like anything that has come before or will come after. So I'm happy that this game tried what it did and pushed the boundaries that it did and failed in a few places. Because of the right lessons are learned by the developers, Monster Hunter as a whole can be made all the better from Rise's findings, and Rise itself will endure as its own title. Its craziness and controversy choices able to be experienced and enjoyed by those who find Rise fun. This is a very long way of saying that the next Monster Hunter game will not be much like Rise at all. It'll take a few notes and carry over what it deems worth carrying while having its own identity. Similarly to how Rise is not much like World at all, and World not much like Generations, and Generations quite different from 4, 
all the way back to the original game. And I'm happy for this fact, because I love Rise for what it is, but I do not want it to be the model for every Monster Hunter game going forwards because it strays from some of the franchise's identity and core design in ways that I do not love. And it very likely won't be that future model. I love Rise as a game, but I don't love it as much specifically as a Monster Hunter game. Now, I've kind of vaguely been talking about the game itself in order to set the context of the video as a whole, and I think it's about time I actually talk about the mechanics of Rise rather than talk around them. Uh, let's go broad first, covering the style and philosophy of its gameplay, as well as the gameplay gimmicks that help to build the style of Rise. Monster Hunter Rise is the most stylish, high-octane, fast-paced, action-oriented, power-fantasy-driven Monster Hunter on the market. It's a game that strove to make the hunters feel powerful, acrobatic, and badass. It is a game that matches the fluidity and responsiveness that World introduced, yet up to the grace and speed at the expense of World's weight and heft. It sought to create an experience that flung you right into the action, cutting back on some of Monster Hunter's traditional prep work in a bid to throw you to the monsters and keep you in the heat of battle with shorter than average breaks in between. Both the gameplay and game design create a pace like lightning. This is a game that does want to immerse you and pull you into its world, but not as much as it wants you to fight every monstrosity it has at its disposal. And the primary driver of this pacing is a certain six-legged silent companion that sticks with you from moment one. It is truly impossible to discuss Monster Hunter Rise's core gameplay without the wirebug. These small, blue, silk-producing insects are the lifeblood of Monster Hunter Rise, the center point to which all else is built around. The game does not function without them. They are the hunter's transportation, aerial maneuvering tool, special attack source, and monster wrangler. In just about every quest you go on, you're going to be using these little bugs in some way, shape, or form. These critters feel more intrinsic to the DNA of their respective game than most other gimmicks in any Monster Hunter games before. In fact, I'd bet the rise in Monster Hunter Rise undoubtedly comes from the sustained aerial movement options that the wire bugs offer. It's pretty impressive just how many uses they came up for for the wire bugs. They don't feel like a tacked on option or an experimental new toy that isn't entirely necessary to utilize, Rise was crafted around this strong as steel silk, pushing to find new ways to integrate it. And as a result, your love or disdain for Monster Hunter Rise is probably going to come down to your opinion on them. As far as I'm concerned, the Wirebugs are a major contributor to Rise being one of the most purely fun titles under the Monster Hunter banner. Big, high damage, flashy attacks and counters that they help you pull off come packed with gratifying and meaty sound effects. The ability to go hurtling through the air at high speed, zipping across gaps and up walls and around the attacks of monsters is exhilarating. It makes traversal more entertaining and engaging than it has ever been, and uh, uh, we will talk about wyvern riding in a little bit. But Put simply, the amount of stuff the wirebugs allow you to have, the depths of experimentation they add, and the pomp and circumstance and power that they put forth makes for a game that's just really fun to play. The wirebugs are a means of empowerment. They want you to feel impressive, flawless, in full perfect control of your weapon and body. Due to the wire bugs, Rise feels like a game that lets the player do as they please more than any other previous entries. No longer are you bound by the strict and uncompromising loading screens of old Monster Hunter games, which mandate the direction that one must take to get from one side of the map to the other. The freedom to either follow the clear path or propel yourself up from mountaintop to mountaintop adds a level of replayability and expression to the simple act of pursuing a monster. Now, after saying all this, you must think that I absolutely adore the Wirebug, and I do, but remember the thesis statement. I love them as an element of Rise. In a game that seeks to make you feel like a graceful, acrobatic, unparalleled badass, they do an excellent job of making you feel like a graceful, acrobatic, unparalleled badass. And I'm glad that there is a Monster Hunter game that makes me feel like a graceful, acrobatic, unparalleled badass. But do I want every Monster Hunter game to create that feeling? No. Monster Hunter 
to me, is a game about a man against the malevolence of nature. Not nature itself, but its most threatening and indiscriminately violent elements, all the while respecting and appreciating the power and might that nature as a sum total offers. Monster Hunter is humbling yet empowering, a franchise that reminds us that we are a part of nature, not its master. And though we have no right over it, we do have a right to stand up for ourselves within it. And to best create a feeling like this, the hunter should feel somewhat small, struggling under the enormity of the power coming down on him, yet strong enough to stand should he summon the will and might necessary. This feeling is admittedly a bit compromised when you can counter a monster's strongest attack, long jump over its back and crack it over the back of the head before zipping out of harm's way, before it has a chance to retaliate. Now, Monster Hunter Rise is far and away not the first game to have cheesy strategies and broken mechanics that can stunlock monsters into irrelevancy, and it's certainly not a game that is mind-numbingly easy from start to finish. I won't pretend that that's the case. However, the tone that Rise presents, the elements of power fantasy that it leans into, the empowerment and speed and height that it wants to give to its hunters cuts into the might of the nature we face off against, removes some of the weight and majesty of the opponent, and eliminates some of its fear factor. Monster Hunter Rise feels like much more of a fair fight, thus compromising on some of the exhilaration that victory can bring during most fights. By the end of Rise and Sunbreak's lifespan, the monsters had to get absolutely ridiculous to be able to keep up with our capabilities and create the intimidating presence that earlier Monster Hunter games were able to create much, much earlier on in their experiences. Monster Hunter Rise was especially guilty of this feeling before Sunbreak came out. One of the great terrors of old school Monster Hunter, the Rajang, was woefully manageable at the game's release. Versions of him in Sunbreak would rectify some of these issues, but ask most people why Rise feels less satisfying than many of its predecessors, and you'll probably see the neutering of Rajang very commonly cited as an example. One of the major reasons a lot of the monsters from the first and second generations of Monster Hunter are remembered with such fond infamy among the fanbase is the lack of power fantasy offered to the hunters. Being able to fight on their level makes us look cooler, sure, and it makes controlling our characters and fighting our opponents really fun, absolutely, but it serves also to somewhat hinder the monsters. And let's face it, for most of us, the true stars of the show aren't the hunters, they're the monsters. And if their coolness is compromised, then that can negatively impact a monster hunter game. And considering what I said about Monster Hunter Rise being mostly built around the wire bugs, we can both give them a lot of thanks for the fun of the core gameplay of Rise and blame them for a lot of the game's compromised sense of fulfillment. The wire bugs are so chock full of use, given so many cool ideas, grant us the ability to do so much stuff that the game is, at least I think, a bit more free than I want Monster Hunter to be. I think mixed feelings is a perfect way to describe my thoughts on the Wirebugs. I'm glad they exist. I enjoyed the power they granted me. They undeniably gave Rise its identity, but I want them to make up only Rise's identity. Again, that thesis statement at the top really helps to explain my complicated thoughts about this game and its gameplay philosophy. And as I write this script, I find myself thankful that I started with that big idea because it really helps to explain how it can be so positive and kind of negative on the same exact subject. This might have been a much more confusing script to write otherwise. Switch skills and silk binds. Okay, now we stray a bit more firmly on the positive side of things and stick a bit closer to the celebration aspect of this video. Though, spoilers, there's some caveats in this section too. Switch skills and silk binds are a major aspect of the customization, personalization, and player choice that Rise offers, where the massive catalog of passive skills that can be placed on your armor has always served to add a mostly intangible layer of customization to the experience. Silk binds and switch skills are much more up in your face, adding flashy new moves to each weapon's kit and altering the properties of many of the weapon's core moves and traits. Every weapon in the game has five switch skills, two of which are silk binds, the other three adjust the properties of certain moves or combos that the weapon uses. Now, 
I just got done talking about how the unbounded freedom and spectacle over struggle served to hinder some of the core DNA of Monster Hunter within Rise, and some of that blame can be laid at the feet of these abilities, though I think that more so goes to the Silkbind attacks specifically. These enormously powerful moves predominantly serve to deal damage in style, whether they are huge hits or timed counter hits that absorb and reflect damage back to monsters. They are the evolution of the Hunter Arts from Monster Hunter Generations, interchangeable stylish super moves that add a bit of an anime flair to combat, hitting the monsters with the same massive force that they can hit you with. The idea of huge stylish super moves isn't a huge problem in of themselves, though perhaps a step beyond the more weighted and semi-grounded approach that I prefer in my Monster Hunter combat, they are satisfying to perform, and I don't think they as a general concept really hurt all that much. It is Ryze's reliance on the counter-oriented silk binds for just about every weapon in the entire game that are at the core of some of the power fantasy bloat. All of a sudden, every weapon is a defensive powerhouse, pushing weapons like the Lance further into irrelevancy whilst turning the monster's biggest attacks from terror-inspiring death blows into surefire ways to score huge amounts of damage. I don't like this choice. It makes defensive weapons and counter-oriented weapons less special. It removes tension. It makes a skilled player damn near untouchable. I wouldn't mind seeing big, huge attacks return in other titles somewhere down the road, but I hope this universal counter system stays solely in Rise. Again, very fun attacks in isolation. Very cool to perform. I love the Metsushiro Yugeki. Don't, uh, that thing is awesome. Uh, but again, they detract a little bit from Monster's sense of challenge. I think I would rather not have them. The rest of the Switch skills, though, might be one of my favorite single ideas that Rise brings to the table, and a feature that I would love to see as an enduring part of this game's legacy. Whereas Silkbind attacks serve to make a weapon look flashy, the three remaining Switch skills overhaul and adjust the identity of the weapons, allowing for fundamental shifts in play style, which can make weapons that a person may have never touched look much more appealing. What I would say is the greatest example of this is the Greatsword. There are a lot of different ways to play this weapon. A lot of really fun ways to play it. Excluding silk binds, you have your traditional common styles of hit and run crit draw attacks or the esteemed and heavily timing and position reliant true charge combo. With the inclusion of switch skills, you can now implement a risk reward play style with the rage slash, an attack that super armors through hits and relies on taking damage to bolster the damage of a charged attack. And if you wanna get really nutty, there's the Surge Slash combo, a ridiculous overhaul of the Greatsword's entire moveset that transforms it from a slow, single-hit weapon into a middling-speed, combo-oriented heavy hitter with a variety of combination paths that end in a charged hit. It is the most viable option if you want to run Greatsword with elemental damage. Now, Surge Slash is not the most mathematically optimal method of playing the weapon. It's perfectly viable for sure, and a good set and player will still get good clear times, but it doesn't have the highest damage per second output that Greatsword has access to. Despite this, I think it might be my personal favorite way to play the weapon in Rise, though I still very much enjoy traditional true charge and often swap between the two styles depending on my target. Not every weapon has a roster of switch skills that change up their weapons to the same radical degree, but Greatsword and Rise I think exemplifies why the switch skills are such a great idea. Fights that I normally would not want to approach with Greatsword, I can now more easily than ever approach just by using a different way of going about the fight, utilizing the weapon in a way I would never have been able to before. Greatsword is the option I point to to explain why I want the switch skills to persist. This is creative freedom, customization, and expression without negative compromise. Switch skills don't change the game, they change the weapons, they broaden their utility, give them an edge in fights that they would classically struggle with. And as I talked about with Greatsword, if these new options aren't really to your liking, the more classical options are still there for you to use. Yes, there are options that are indeed mathematically better than others, but fundamentally, switch skills are designed for horizontal alterations to weapon power, not vertical. I think they're fantastic, and I want to see them explored more, as some weapons got huge, gameplay-defining reimaginings, and others got 
less substantial changes. What we have in Rise feels like a beta test for the potential of the Switch skill, and I'd love to see more sunk into this concept. And I didn't even mention the continued versatility that Sunbreak offered in the Switch skill swap, a feature that allows players to save two different loadouts of Switch skills on their person at a time and swap between them with a certain input. Now, the Switch skill swap is a pretty nutty option that, although a nice accessory, I don't think is super necessary going forward but it adds just that extra layer of complexity and theory crafting that makes the weapon personalization of Rise special. Super creative players can find ways to use different switch skills in tandem with different armor skills, to create these multi-step strategies built around setting up monsters with one set of abilities and following up for big damage with another. There's a lot of really cool stuff here if you want to get into the weeds of it. Spirit of Birds and Endemic Life Endemic Life is one of the single greatest additions to Monster Hunter Rise, and I desperately want it to be a permanent series feature. Partially because Rise's lightning fast and action-driven philosophy kinda shot this fantastic idea in the foot. Immersion with the natural environment is one of the most important aspects of Monster Hunter, and the focus on this concept is what drove Monster Hunter World to be the beloved powerhouse that it is. The gathering of helpful materials out in the world, the ecosystems of diverse life, complex power structures and hierarchies, the varied biomes within certain maps, and the monsters who claim their own small carved out territories, their own little slice of the world, the casual interactions that the monsters have with each other and their environment while they're not fighting you, these small details and mechanics serve to convince you that this isn't a piece of software, that this is a living, breathing ecosystem that would flourish with or without our presence. Rise's focus on action and speed ultimately fights against the series' desire to suck you into its environments. Although you absolutely can and should take your time exploring the many maps that Rise has to offer, they are packed to the brim with cool areas and little secrets and collectibles. Many of the small details and interactions that made World feel so alive are unfortunately absent from Rise, offering less incentive to simply stop and take the world in. Which is truly unfortunate, as Endemic Life is one of the single most immersive mechanics I think we've seen. Oftentimes, Monster Hunter's quest prep work is spent huddled over an item box in the quest hub, picking and choosing among items that we deem necessary for our battle, and if there's space, grabbing a few extra items to combine into more useful tools, should the initial stock run out. These mechanics, of course, still exist in Monster Hunter Rise, but the most interesting and fun quest prep is now located on the actual map. Spattered throughout each and every map in set locations are small animals, each with their own abilities and properties that can be utilized for your benefit during a hunt. The Antidobra have poison-canceling properties in their bite. Stink minks can lure creatures into different areas with their scent. Trap bugs create flinch-inducing caltrops. Marionette spiders can yank monsters into walls. And the variety of toads can induce a slew of advantageous status effects. There's even beetles that can inflict elemental blights on monsters, the first time that's an ever been possible in these games. This mechanic rewards exploration, prep work, map knowledge, utilization of the advantages of nature and the environment. This is hunting. Is endemic life 100% necessary to completing quests? Nope, entirely optional, but it is rewarding and it gives you the feeling of mastery over your environment, that the natural world is as much your weapon as the steel you carry. I hope to God that this feature doesn't get lost to time because Rides kinda stepped on this idea's toes. Rides' emphasis on speed and battle over immersion and environment building serves to hinder a mechanic built around environmental exploration. Now, it's not like Endemic Life is a completely unused mechanic, the Endemic Life is scattered all over the the place on the maps. They aren't particularly out of the way. You're going to bump into these things and occasionally use them. I find that Rise's environments lack the same gravitational pull that worlds do and thus underserve endemic life, making them easier to pass by. And in my personal opinion, I think the developers compensated for this with the not particularly popular decision to tie max health and stamina to another aspect of environmental delving, Spira Birds. These guys aren't multifaceted small animals with natural abilities that can be used to your advantage. These are little multicolored birds with nectar that can permanently increase your max health and stamina, as well as permanently increase your defense and raw attack. I think the developers realized that Rise was a super high speed game that incentivized delving into fights, and in an attempt 
to get players to engage with endemic life and explore the maps. They made it so that very necessary stats were only attainable via running around and touching birds. This feels like a chore. This doesn't feel like an immersive world that invites you to come explore and reap the benefits of mastery. This feels like an artificial way to involuntarily guide you into the map. I do not like Spirit Birds. I do not like that there is no good way to bypass them, save for a skill that automatically drip feeds you these permanent buffs. I do not like that Rise lacks the confidence in its maps that World has and feels the need to drag you into its depths rather than reward you for making a choice to do so of your own volition. And I think I hate the impact that Spirit Birds had on Rise's endgame. I hope Endemic Life finds its way into a Monster Hunter game that is a bit better built for them. I think a monster game that naturally draws its players into the depths of its maps will highlight just how well thought out this system is. And I think that Endemic Life shows that the team wasn't trying to necessarily turn Monster Hunter Rise into a pure action game, as some accuse it of being. Endemic Life feels like a peak Monster Hunter idea, reaffirming our bond to the natural world and shifting our quest preparation in a way that feels more immersive. Palamutes. Monster Hunter Rise brings with it a new breed of companion. Whereas the cat-like palicos are effective gatherers and supportive combatants, the dog-like palamutes serve as a more directly combat-oriented companion and a method of transport. And as a big dog person, I love these guys. They're maybe not as competitively viable as Palicos, but they still do good work in combat, especially when it comes to status application. I think they look great too. They have their own fun personality, a lot of armor sets that look excellent, they control very well, they're fun to race around the maps. I think they're just really awesome additions. The only issue that Palamutes potentially bring up is that they contribute to the speed of traversal that Monster Hunter Rise has a bit of an issue with. They can move across the map so quickly that they're part of why it's so easy to bypass some of the cool stuff on the maps. The best way to fix this, I think, is to maybe slow them down a little bit and limit their ability to scale surfaces. Give them a few more limitations so that there's still a bit more reason to move on foot and a bit more incentive to take the world in. I don't think the Palamutes are particularly detrimental, and honestly, I think you kind of need a mechanic like Palamutes to keep travel fun. One of my least favorite aspects of the old Monster Hunter games were the huge, flat, uninteresting battle zones that you had to run across back and forth, moving through loading screens while watching your stamina bar go up and down over and over, all because Diablos dug from one corner of the continent to the other corner of the continent, only for him to move to another zone because you took too long to sprint across creation, so you have to manage your stamina again, go through the loading screens again, all while your paintball wore off because you forgot to reapply it, so now you have no idea where the Diablos is because he moved again, and you have to go across more loading screens, and now your cool drink wore off because you've been running for five minutes, and its point being, map traversal in some of those old games just sucked. <laughs> I think a fun traversal option like the Palamutes is a necessary addition as the maps get larger and more complicated and better, honestly. It is more fun to move around and rise than it is in pretty much any other Monster Hunter game. I think the best way to not make things feel too fast and to make things too easy to bypass in the maps is just to limit the Palamutes a little and use the Slinger and Wedge Beetles again, as opposed to the Wirebug Traversal. A happy medium between map blitzing and slow, tedious, monotonous, time-consuming, and I'm tired of holding my PSP like this and my fingers are cramping and oh my god, why are these desert maps so empty and like 10 miles across? I hate this! Give Palamutes a bit of a damage buff to compensate for the utility of Palicos, and I think you've got a solid new mechanic for Monster Hunter, as well as a really great new companion. Again, the Palamutes are just fun to interact with. I'd love to see them return. Followers. Sunbreak reintroduced a pretty awesome mechanic into Monster Hunter, that being NPC Hunters. I say reintroduced because this was an idea first introduced in Monster Hunter Frontier, and the bones of a mechanic like this were in 4 Ultimate and a little 
little bit in World Iceborne. So it's pretty new to the vast majority of us, especially on this level, but not to the franchise at all. Within a certain few story quests in Sunbreak, typically the urgent quests, Dame Fiorraine will join you out in the field. We're not talking about the game story just yet, but simply having this other character who is supposed to be a warrior of this region fighting with you against the monsters that are a threat to her people and kingdom does strengthen the storytelling of the game. For a little while after, there were some follower subquest storylines you could do for all the involved characters, leading to rewards being unlocked and quests called support surveys that let you play with the follower mechanic if you really liked it. But this system was kind of just locked in its own little corner of the game. Like, the developers wanted Fiorraine in the quests, but didn't have too many other uses for this mechanic in other parts of the game. Eventually, they made the excellent choice to open up followers to be taken on just about every quest in the entire game. There are 10 followers in total. Five of them are Kimura characters and five are Elgato characters. Each character has a limited selection of weapons that they're proficient with and of different gameplay styles. Some are heavier attackers, others are big into support item use, and others work to keep you alive with buffs and heals. Now, followers don't really do a lot of damage and they don't bloat monster health and damage all that much either. They aren't here to nullify monsters for you and to rapidly expedite your clear times, but they do provide some very useful utility and take care of endemic life usage, heals, and wyvern writing that you may be too busy hunting your target to deal with. With. They also will draw a couple of hits away and they can't be carded, though they can be knocked down for a brief period of time. Due to the fact that these guys don't output a ton of damage, the more useful followers are going to be the ones that are making you a better hunter, so any follower with a hunting horn or Luchica's status bow gun usage is probably the best bang for your buck with followers, but if you want to run a hunt with the characters that you just like, you'll get yourself a hunt that's a little bit less stressful and with some automated assistance. I find that having followers with me usually shaves off a bit of time and a lot of resource consumption off of higher level endgame quests. So I really appreciate having them around to just make the grind of the game much more manageable. And the best part, with the exception of like seven or eight quests, this mechanic is entirely optional. Unlike wire bugs or switch skills or wyvern riding or the clutch claw from Iceborne or something like that, there is no aspect of Sunbreak that is massively built around followers, except for a couple of story quests. They aren't intrusive on the game at all. The game doesn't have to be bent around this feature being in it. You can use followers if you want to and ignore them if you don't. Honestly, the most important role of the follower mechanic plays is story related. Not only does Fear Rain help you in the story, but these follower subquests have their own little story arcs in them, where you can learn more about the characters, their personalities, and their relationships with one another. You often spend so much time in these games separated from the NPCs, and for so long these characters never even had proper names, making them pretty tough to be attached to sometimes, having them out in the field with you, going through a bit of a character arc, expressing how they feel about hunting or about another character or some aspect of themselves, does quite a bit to turn Sunbreak's cast of characters into a pretty likable one, and serves to add a bit of life to Rise's cast as well. The follower system is excellent. It's totally optional, it's unobtrusive, it serves the game's characters, and it is legitimately helpful in combat with little to no drawbacks. I have honestly no complaints about this idea. Wyvern riding. Okay, there's a reason I didn't cover this topic much when I discussed the wire bugs, and that's because this needs its own section. This video is entitled A Celebration of Monster Hunter Rise, and so far, I've been going over why I love this game, with caveats here and there to express where I think this game has had some shortcomings. Wyvern riding, on the other hand, I don't have the highest of opinions on. This was such a cool idea on paper, and a really awesome thing to see in the trailers leading up to this game. Another brilliant idea idea on how to make the wire bugs feel incredibly important to Rise's identity. A series of puppeteering snares that take control of the limbs of a stunned monster, compel it to fight on your behalf. Seizing control of a monster and riding into battle against another is so cool. It's so cool. Being able to use their attacks and manually conduct these little duels between them is, it's awesome. It's something that we've probably always kind of wanted to do. And it was really fun at launch, and it just butchered the way monsters work in this game. Okay, so wyvern riding in of itself. Though very over the top and very silly and maybe a touch beyond what hunters should be able to do, for example, wrangling fallen elder dragons, isn't exactly the problem. The problem is how they built the game around wyvern riding. 
When you boot up a quest, you have a target monster, maybe more than one, but ideally you are taking on your target one on one. Facing down one monster is a challenge in of itself. Add a second one into the mix and things devolve into chaos. The monsters are attacking each other. They're attacking you. Fireballs and tail swings fly this way and that way and it's a violent, uncontrollable mess. And I love it. Other monsters on the map are hazards, terrors, intrusions. Precautions need to be made to divert them or repel them. Perhaps draw your true target into them or away from them. They are something you need to be wary of at all times. A collision with a devil joke can turn a simple Rathian hunt into a nightmare scenario. Scenario. Wyvern Riding removes this chaos. Wyvern Riding removes this fear, this wild factor, this feeling that the unpredictable can happen at any time and that you must be able to adapt to a situation going from bad to worse in the blink of an eye. Wyvern Riding and the desire of Rise for you to utilize this mechanic turns these chaotic fun factor wild cards into scripted tools for you to manipulate to your heart's content. Other monsters on the map feel like programmed, task-driven, agency-devoid resources for you to use at your leisure. I should be mortified that there is a Rajang on the same map as my Diablos hunt. In Rise, I am not. In Monster Hunter Rise, a Rajang on my hunt means all I have to do is either wait for a few minutes for them to bump into each other, or I can expedite the process by grabbing a spider and making it throw silk at the Rajang to force it into a rideable state, so I can go steer it into the Diablos, get thousands of points of free damage for minimal effort, and then when I'm done with it, the Rajang will run off to stop bothering me and let me capitalize on my free knockdown and continue my fight. Monsters being in the same zone in Rise exists only to proc a Wyvern ride on one another. They don't team up, they don't really fight one another, they don't drag the battle to other parts of the map, they don't chase after one another. They show up, smack each other, wait for a ride to occur or not occur, and then one of them leaves. Maybe they'll do a turf war if the pair has one, but that's about it. It's so scripted. It's so lifeless. It's so robotic. These other monsters are tools, not animals. They fill a role and then leave. I hope Wyvern writing as it is and as it is programmed never comes back. It is possibly salvageable and the idea of riding on a monster is still great, but it can't work like this again. I almost feel like I can see the lines of code triggering certain behaviors and patterns and I hate that, but we all thought it was sick when Magnamalo dropped down into the fight with all Mother Narwa to fight alongside us, and we got to ride it into battle against the big boss of the game. And we all thought it was sick as f when Utsushi brought the Apex and Ogre to fight Amatsu, and the two of us together rode a previously unrideable monster against one of the last bosses in the game. And every time a title update dropped, we were all super excited to see what attacks you could do with the brand new monster. We all got kind of giddy when you could do the really cool big explosion and fireball and laser attacks for ourselves. Again, the thesis statement maintains, Wyvern writing is an awesome idea on paper. I'm glad they tried it. Maybe they'll be able to improve it or retool it in a slightly different format. I really hope they know it did not work this time. Rise through a dart at the board and man did it not stick for very long, but hey, at least it's throwing darts. The novelty wore off pretty quick and I hate the ripple effect that Wyvern writing had on the game, but it's pretty fun as its own thing. That should stay in Rise and only in Rise, please. We're gonna wrap this more gameplay oriented section of the video up with a discussion about Rise and Sunbreak's core end game looping content. That being the Rampage and the Anomaly Investigations. Both of these two quest types make up a good amount of what you'll be running to grind end game rewards. Rampage is a little bit less so, but this is the section I felt it worked in best. And I'm gonna start with the Rampage as they capped off the core game of Rise. I think we might have been a little bit mean to the Rampage game mode. I ain't saying it's secretly the best part of the game or anything, but Man, it was pretty fun, and a nice shift in traditional monster interaction. Manifested by the Storm Serpents, the Rampage is a swarm of monsters fleeing the mighty Elder Dragons and trampling all they can in order to survive. With Kimura Village directly in the Rampage's way, you're tasked with manning a fortification armed to the teeth with various defensive weapons, which you will build and utilize to drive the swarm back. I am still legitimately surprised that the Nintendo Switch can handle this as well as it does. 
It can be pretty fun to boot up a rampage every once in a while, especially multiplayer. Leaping from structure to structure, hopping between cannons and ballista, using their varying functionalities to deal with the monster horde in different ways, be it easy stuns with shock ammo or tethering them in place with a binder shot. There's a decent variety of options for you to use against these opponents. When you want to hop down to the trenches and face them with your weapon, you feel pretty small against the huge tide of rampaging beasts. Sometimes you hold the line perfectly and you never lose an installation until a rampage apex bursts down the doors and forces a fight at the last gate. Sometimes your defenses are slowly battered down one by one and you have to keep setting up new defenses on the fly to keep the counterattack alive. And sometimes you're able to get a wyvern ride and start laying waste to the swarm by turning the monsters against one another. The rampage is a mode that is built to be fun for you and your friends, built to create memorable moments and built to properly integrate the wirebug mechanics intrinsic to the game. Now, this feeling of exhilaration does not last forever, though you do need to pay attention, you do have to try to lose. To balance for players fighting by themselves, the rampage is fairly easy, and the source of tension that the game mode wants to provide does not always manifest. Not to mention that the gameplay is fairly repetitive, so I see why it isn't a beloved mode. But it is a way to mix up Monster Hunter, it is a way to blend the game mechanics even more into the gameplay. As a sight and spectacle and show of power for the upcoming Elder Dragons, the Rampages are a pretty damn cool story device, and there is a pure fun factor to the Rampage, especially with friends. Now, I know there are some people who prefer to play Monster Hunter alone and don't like quests like Rampages or Sieges that incentivize multiplayer, but I'm sorry, this is a multiplayer series. That's what it was designed for. The reason Monster Hunter was predominantly on PSP and 3DS for over a decade was because portable consoles were how most Japanese people preferred their multiplayer experiences. Teamwork and collaboration amongst a group of hunters to bring down something bigger than themselves is what these games are about, and nothing's bigger than an oncoming tidal wave of monsters. The Rampage is built with the idea of you and a group of friends collaborating to defend a fortress together, using different weapons and abilities and advantages in tandem, and playing in this way does increase the fun factor. I will never not advocate for some form of gameplay in Monster Hunter that incentivizes teamwork and coordination. It's as big a part of Monster Hunter as any other, and I will never agree with the sentiment that modes like Rampages and Sieges should not be implemented. The Rampage is a fun, if simple, spectacle-driven game mode. It adds diversity to Ryza's story, shows off the main antagonist's powers, and is structured around flexing the strengths of the Wirebug and encouraging multiplayer. It gets a lot right, and although it didn't fit into Sunbreak's story, I wish they found a way to implement it into Master Rank. Anomaly and its investigations. Now, this is a hefty topic that I'll try not to take too long giving my thoughts on. First off, let's talk about the actual anomaly hunts. I think the mechanics of the fights themselves are pretty well thought out, honestly. In addition to your regular monster fight, the creatures you encounter will have higher health and attack when in raid. Their bodies will gain a dark red tint and glowing red orbs will manifest on key parts of their body. This represents the blood-based affliction that has inflicted these monsters, courtesy of the parasitic Kirio. While in this state, most of the monster's physical attacks can inflict blood blight, which is essentially Bloodborne's rally mechanic, where dealing damage can recover health. The caveat being that healing items have their efficacy halved. Additionally, monsters hit even harder and their attack speed is increased, making even some of the lower level monsters sufficient challenges for well-trained hunters. Dealing efficient damage to these glowing red pustules will cause them to burst for high damage. Dealing enough damage to the monster when they are enraged will trigger a full knockdown, fully dissipate the affliction's effects for a period of time, and will usually leave the monster in an exhausted state. The process will repeat until the monster becomes enraged again, and this cycle will maintain until the target is defeated. Victory over an afflicted monster drops their monster parts, as well as afflicted special parts, which are exclusive to the difficulty of that afflicted monster monster and what monster you are facing. I really enjoy this extra fighting mechanic layer. It adds this 
level of chess to a monster fight. Already, you have to know their weak points, tells, patterns, hit zones, and hit boxes. But now, you have to factor in the placement of these affliction spheres. Player placement, proper timing, and attack reading all become even more important. Keeping track of which afflicted spots you have hit already and maintaining pressure on those spots is paramount. You have to already learn this fight once. Now the game is asking you to learn it even more thoroughly and proficiently. On top of this, the battle itself is more intense, more challenging, faster paced. Decisions need to be made quickly, and you have to make choices on the fly. The skills in the game allow you to make better use of Blood Blight, or gain more advantages from a monster being enraged, should you choose to implement them. Yes, you are fighting the same monsters, but the Affliction asks that you re-evaluate your process and up your game even further. And if you are successful, you are rewarded with massive damage, easy damage opportunities, and a lull period in the fight to de-stress and not worry too much. This creates a nice ebb and flow to the Afflicted battle. I love how this mechanic was structured. I love what it adds to the fights and how it freshens up the monster roster. The only thing I don't love is the health bloat. Some of these afflicted monsters get really, really meaty and kind of require super high damage sets to adequately get through their health bars. Some of these fights can feel a bit dragged out and the pacing of the afflicted quests can feel a little sluggish, but mechanically, I think they're very inspired. As for the afflicted rewards and how they are implemented, I really like the structure here too. And again, my only real issue here is pacing. Just about every single monster on the entire roster, minus the big bosses and a couple of the title update monsters, can be fought in Anomaly at Investigations. These are kind of a mash of tempered investigations from World and Guild Quests from Four Ultimates. You fight these powered up monsters to get special rewards, whilst these randomly generated quests increase in difficulty, leveling up to a maximum of level 300. Every tier of monster has a batch of afflicted parts they can drop. For example, some tier 1 monsters drop afflicted bones, some drop afflicted pelts, but only tier 1s can drop pelts or bones. Tier 2 monsters drop afflicted blood or shell. Now, all these afflicted parts are important and necessary to equip your gear with endgame upgrades. And the best part about this, the part that I really appreciate about Sunbreak's endgame, is that every monster matters. More than in any other Monster Hunter game ever made. Every monster matters. Every monster is valuable. Every monster has something to contribute. Every monster should be hunted. And I love this. Because time after time after time, the smaller, weaker, personality field, environment flushing out, quirky, goofy, and wacky boss monsters get completely abandoned, forgotten, and neglected. Yeah, sure, you can find them on the map and maybe occasionally fight them for fun, but usually you're only fighting Elder Dragons and super powerful subspecies and whatnot at the end of every monster in a game. And yes, the Anomaly Investigations do have a few issues and I'll talk about them, but before I get into anything else I want to hammer this point in because I kind of think this makes the issue worth it those raptors that you bulldoze in the early game and never fight all that much because their gear isn't great get to contribute and be important and have parts that you need that really cool tier 3 monster that you love but you don't get to hunt that much because it's just not something that important to getting the best gear in the game now has a reason to be hunted and I love Sunbreak's endgame for this fact now yes this anomaly investigation has pacing issues too. Though the drop rates are okay for these parts, they're not super ridiculously fast, and perfecting just one set of weapons and armor is a pretty heavy time commitment, and we typically like to run a lot of sets. But running a lot of sets can be a little detrimental because, as I stated earlier, some of these afflicted monsters take a while to fight. So if your upgrades are scattered, it can take even longer to really maximize a set. Let's not pretend that the system drip feeds you the parts you need. It's an okay pace, but it still takes a long time to really get a good stockpile going. And this is ultimately the biggest issue with the Anomaly Investigation system. They are slower paced quests because of the health bloat, with a middling reward drop rate, with a slow rate of progression. It takes a lot of time to level up these quests and get them to the point where they're dropping the highest caliber of rewards. And to get yourself to the level where you can undertake these higher level investigations. And 
and that is ultimately the issue. Three layers of slow to middling pacing that makes it a very mechanically rich and rewarding system that decelerates its pace below what I think it should be. There's also the matter of skill bloat and the endlessness of the anomaly investigation system that I have seen some not being fans of. Higher and higher health thresholds of the monsters required higher and higher power creep as Sunbreak's post-launch went on, and this had positives and negatives to it. One, as the monsters required bigger and bigger numbers, super damage-oriented builds became more necessary, and this can threaten to homogenize builds a little and de-incentivize more experimental sets. Now, of course, you can always make your more gimmicky sets and play around with it, it'll just take longer to progress. On the other hand, Sunbreak probably has some of the most creative, if not complicated skills that we've ever seen in these games. Title update monster weapons with passive abilities, attack and status bonuses off of perfect evades, an explosive aura that detonates if you don't get hit, a defensive counterpart to agitator, a skill that pulls monsters aggro and bolsters evasiveness when targeted, health regeneration after a part break, so many cool and fun new ideas that created their own level of theory crafting and bolstered the traditional attack up and crit skills with new gameplay styles and new niche strategies, new ways to approach weapons. Did the power creep and potential skill list get a bit too ridiculous? That's up to you. Big numbers go bonk is going to appeal to some more than others. Some will love to jack their sets full of as many skills as possible in an effort to become even more godly. And some would prefer a return to a more meticulous and limited pool of skill choices that makes every option more valuable and every choice much more meaningful. And I think there's no wrong answer here. However, though I do think the Monster Hunter game is going to cool things down again, I think this level of power creep will never fully dissipate. And for the sake of a more tame endgame, I'm really hoping we get some ports of the classic Monster Hunter titles at some point. And lastly, I want to talk about the endless nature of the endgame. Again, there's some pros and cons here. Having this vast and middling paced endgame with so many endless options kind of tickles the brain to keep playing and playing and playing because you got to get to the stuff at the end and you got to make your perfect build and you got to unlock the highest level of decorations and you got to get to Afflicted Rank 300. And I absolutely 100% why the system really burned some people out and soured some people on the experience. These options being there kind of stimulates your brain chemistry to pursue these systems all the way to their end. And the fact that the anomaly investigation system is not very well paced can make doing this feel like an absolute chore. And again, you are not wrong for having this complaint. There are objective pacing flaws here that make the end game seem both endless and slow, and that is not satisfying. Allow me to offer a bit of my own perspective here. The level 300 quests and highest level upgrades and decorations and all that stuff are nothing more than busy work to give you a form of progress while you keep playing the game. The disadvantage of having a game like Monster Hunter have a very, very clear and definitively endable end game is that eventually you can find yourself running out of reasons to play the game. Your sets are perfect and you can kind of just crush everything. With a game like Sunbreak, you always have a car to chase, right? You always have a reason to keep playing. To me, all these complex systems are less a goal than they are a means to keep playing a means to an end, and that end is to feel like I'm still progressing with every hunt I do. And when I lost the interest in the investigation system, I just stopped doing it. I'm at an anomaly level 170 out of 300. I will likely never reach 300. And that's fine, because I played the game until I wanted to play something else. And I don't feel any fear of missing out, because Sunbreak's endgame, it's an infinity ladder to nowhere. There's no secret monster hidden at AR 300. There's no special variant or secret quest or unique weapon or armor skill. I'll probably pick the game back up and run some of these quests again, because they are fun. But I know that all that lies ahead is just bigger numbers. That's cool. I don't feel the need to chase it. I never did because it's an affinity ladder to nowhere. Like I said, in my opinion, you don't force yourself to play the anomaly investigations in order to love Sunbreak. You play them because you already loved Sunbreak and you want an excuse to keep enjoying it. What these investigations allow is for you to keep playing and playing and playing and always progress, but never really be done. You can always be better. You can always improve your gameplay and your numbers, and you're free to do so until you want to stop. And it's perfectly okay to stop whenever you want. 
because it's an infinity ladder to nowhere. Primordial Malzino, the final boss of the entire game, can be fought at Master Rank 10. Risen Shigaru Magala, the highest level unlock of the game, gets unlocked at I think Master Rank 180. Those are the two final monsters, those are the two final armor and weapon sets, all unlockable without touching the end game. The meat and potatoes, the things we really care about, the core selling points of Monster Hunter, you don't even have to look at the anomaly investigations to engage with them. The end game is just an excuse to keep playing. And when I was done, I was done. Not burnt out, not worrying that I hadn't done literally everything in the game because I did all the things that actually mattered. And yes, that was the abbreviated and condensed form of my thoughts on Sunbreak's Endgame. Uh, it is a bloated, poorly paced, over the top, endless ladder that has some key objective flaws that burned out a decent portion of its player base. It needed faster leveling, faster hunts, and greater part drop rates, or at least some combination of those three. It was designed in such a way that I don't blame anyone for burning themselves out on it. However, it was also a creative system that recontextualized fights, made every monster in the game matter, introduced a bounty of new mechanics and skills, and wisely hid nothing at the end save for a few powerful decorations. It has one massive core flaw, but so many competently woven together details and intricacies that it was a blast to play through until it wasn't. And when it wasn't, I was fine with putting it down. I'm sure that these infinity ladder to nowhere endgame structures will endure, and I hope the developers learned the right lessons to prevent the issue that this system faced from occurring again, whilst allowing the strengths of an endgame like this to stand out more poignantly. Now, that covers all the elements of mechanics and gameplay that I wanted to cover, onto the elements that make Monster Hunter feel alive. Alrighty, let's talk about the stars of the show. The monsters are half the name of the franchise and honestly the favorite half of most of us. To make a good Monster Hunter monster roster, you need a healthy sample of fantastic brand new creatures to keep the game feeling fresh and new, as well as a sizable stockpile of returning monsters to add a proper heft and recognizability to the roster, while also revamping those classics to add some extra spice to the monsters we already know. I'm gonna go through Rise's original creations first, then Sunbreaks, then the returning roster. I'll give a brief synopsis and opinion on all of Rise's new monsters, and then an opinion on who they chose to bring back. Great Izuchi is the most recent take on a tried and true tradition of raptor-esque bird wyverns being the game's first boss. He is also the fifth, uh, sixth actually counting explore, member of the dog wyvern category of the runner bird wyverns. Uh, watch Oceanus' content for more info on how all that works. My favorite aspect about him is his heavily mammalian influence in his design. He's covered head to toe in fur rather than feathers or scales and I think that helps him stand out amongst his brothers a bit. He was sold as a monster who fights in tandem with his pack of lesser Izuchi, and he, uh, he dies, but not much. If he has any living Izuchi with him, they will sync up for some of his bigger attacks that he summons them for, but the Izuchi can be easily defeated, they don't replenish very often, and only mirror some of his attacks, and only on his flanks. It's a neat little gimmick that doesn't really get the screen time that was promised. I do like his fairly wide arsenal of attacks that he throws out using that curved scythe blade tail of his. For such an early game monster, I think he's got a pretty decent move move pool, and though I don't think he's as good as some of his cousins, I do remember him. Aknosom is a bit of a stand-in for the Yan Kutku, a low-level and small-sized bird wyvern that weaponizes fire in short-range projectiles that fire off in more of a bouncing arc than a forward-moving line like a Rathalos or a Rathian would. Similar role, but that's kind of where the similarities end between Kutku and Aknosom. Aknosom is one of the more elegant and graceful monsters out there, actually, almost kind of like a dancer. He hops from foot to foot, attacking with his wings and legs in a series of chops and sweeps and kicks that are very beautifully animated. The fireballs he exhales have this unique bouncing mechanic where they ricochet along the ground for a little while, kind of faking you out where they're going to land and making you second guess how safe your distance is. It's a pretty memorable display for such a low level monster. I love how the parasol like crest on his head changes shape and size and he can implement them into some of his attacks. I think Agnesom's pretty underrated, honestly. Tetronodon is the third entry into the inferior 
amphibian category and is a really personality filled addition to the small and new yet still very lively and memorable monster category. Tetronodon is a massive frog like beast with a platypus beak who is covered in a green mossy hide and fights like a sumo wrestler. He's your traditional big slow heavy hitter early game monster who poses a threat to the unprepared and can maybe sneak in a few unexpected carts here or there but can be danced around fairly easily. He's a joy honestly from his huge inflatable belly that he throws around to his sumo inspired animations to his rock flinging and water projectiles. He's a really good goofy monster something you kind of can't help but smile at and he has the honor of being the model for the training dummy in town which is one of the game's most useful features so extra props to him for that. Bishaten is probably the most unique of all the monkey monsters that we have. Right off the bat, he's one of the smaller monkey monsters. He has a much longer tail and has wing-like flaps coming out of his arms. Kind of like Tetronodon, he's more of a charming, goofy type of monster with a fun gimmick. However, he's much more of a trickster than a big, hefty bruiser. Bishaten's got a love of fruit and carries a ton of it with him in his little pouch he has. When he's not eating it, he will use it to defend himself, resulting in a series of attacks with multifaceted fruits being slammed, tossed, and flung at you with his arms or tail. And these fruits can have all kinds of little extra detriments like paralysis, poison, and blinding stun. Sometimes he has well telegraphed attacks where he uses certain fruits specifically. Sometimes he just throws a dozen of them at the same time in a huge barrage. And if you get hit by one of the status ones, well, then that's the status you're taking. Additionally, he's got this nearly hand-like tail covered in these opposable digits that can grip onto things and hold his weight aloft. He's got pretty perfect control with it, letting him attack with all his limbs while keeping his torso out of arm's way. And sometimes it lets him go rocketing across the battlefield. He's a pretty wonderfully designed creature who is a lot of fun to fight. His gimmicks are more fun than annoying, and there's really just nothing like him in Monster Hunter that can move quite like him or fight quite like him. The monkeys are a long-lived subcategory of the Fang Beast, and it's awesome to see a fresh take on this concept. Somnicanth is our first new Leviathan, and to call a monster the best sleep status monster in Monster Hunter, uh, it sounds like calling a monster the best variant of the flu, but Somnicanth's pretty good. I like the kind of creepy and gangly design. She's not a conventionally cool monster, and has this kind of haunting look to her. There's an unnerving, almost human-like quality to her expression. She looks intelligent, malevolent. I kind of like how weird she is. And it's backed by a pretty neat color scheme of like the sickly yellow and vibrant purple on her fins. As stated, she's a sleep monster, kind of modeled after a siren or a mermaid, luring in prey with her song before knocking them out with a sleep-inducing powder and killing them easily. What makes Somnicanth work as a sleep monster, what makes Somnicanth work as a sleep monster is that she can do a lot of other things and doesn't use sleep as too much of a crutch. What sleep attacks she does have are usually pretty big areas of effect and can be followed up with really heavy hitting physical attacks, but they're also heavily telegraphed and pretty easy to evade. Additionally, she's got a lot of attacks using her long tail and the massive fin atop her head, as well as the ability to weaponize various shells she digs up out of the water to attack with. My favorite being where she encircles an area in sleep gas, trapping targets in a certain area before she detonates a blast shell. It's a very cool way for a monster to weaponize its environment. Due to her very slender body, she also works perfectly for a lot of the shallow water areas found in several of Ryze's maps, letting her swim around and feel like a proper aquatic fight in the game that otherwise wouldn't have allowed for it. Not one of my all-time favorite creations of Ryze, but she improves on a pretty hated status effect and makes for a really good weirdo monster. Magnamalo is our flagship for Monster Hunter Rise, and oh man does he encapsulate my thoughts about this game. He is super cool, and I like him a lot, honestly, but yeesh, he is a bit of a step outside the norm for monster designs. I, I ain't gonna pretend like I don't know why some people really don't like him. Magnamala feels like a monster that could have used another round of simplification. His evil ghost samurai and will-o'-the-wisp design inspirations are enormously blatant. Whereas all of the other Rise monsters are based on yokai from Japanese mythology, Magnamalo looks like he was just ripped out of a myth and legend rather than just based on one. He feels extremely stylized in his design. He's also got kind of bit of an air of cooler than you syndrome where he's got huge blades coming out of his arms and purple hellfire coming off of his body and big retractable spikes coming out of his back and he wins turf wars with elder dragons. He also borrows a ton of moves and gimmicks from other monsters, as well as having only a slightly altered form of blast as his main element, and 
all things considered, he has a pretty negligible impact as a flagship with his own game, but we're gonna talk about that later. Objectively, I get it. I get the problems he has, and I can't agree with some of these points, but I don't know, I, I, I don't really give a f so far, Rise has some of the goofiest goofy monsters, some of the most stylish graceful monsters, and some of the oddest weirdo monsters. Makes sense that it has one of the most badass edgy tryhard monsters too, because Monster Hunter does have those. In a world of more proper animals, he feels like a demon, a malicious, tenacious, territorial, exploitative, and fearless super predator that will pick a fight with just about anything if it means bolstering his own strength. I love how they took the myths surrounding him, that he can weaponize the souls of his victims, and scientifically reinterpreted it as weaponized flammable gases from the bone marrow of his prey that he expels as a defensive weapon. I kind of love how ridiculous it is that he doesn't just have retractable claws, but like full-on retractable battle armor. He looks really cool when he's wreathed in his hellfire. I love what a creative combatant he is, using his hellfire burst to launch himself, his implementation of his whole body in combat his fake out knockdown to bait hunters into overextending themselves, and his great mix up of ranged and physical attacks. Yes, I think his design may have benefited as a monster hunter monster if it was given a bit of a tone down and a little bit less style over sleekness, but honestly, I think there's a reason why he has a ton of awesome artwork and sticks in the mind of a lot of his fans. To me, Magnamalo does indeed abandon some, not all, of the grounded principles that make monster hunter monster design very special, but in turn, he is a full-on embrace of the unadulterated pure cool factor that also contributes to what makes these creatures so special. He might be a bit too on one side of that spectrum for you, and I can respect that. I probably can't change your mind, and you won't change mine. But much like the game he is from, damn, he's cool. And I really hope he has a positive and continuous legacy going forwards. I definitely want to do a full video on him sometime in the future. Goss Harag, on the other hand, is a very uncontroversial monster and a pretty major runaway hit for Rise. Maybe it's single best new creature, and I really don't gotta justify why. Like Bish he is a fanged beast and a new addition to one of its long-running subgroups. Instead of being a monkey, Gosharag is our newest bear. Unlike Bishatan, Gosharag is not a new low-level addition to the group, but rather the bear's undisputed king, a massive, hulking beast that stalks the frozen islands. He starts out as a bit of a bruiser and brawler before getting angry. When livid, he'll coat his forelimbs in frozen fluids that solidify into massive blade-like weapons. That is, that's really... Cool. <laughs> when I saw Goss Harag in the marketing, I thought he was going to be a little too human-like, that a monster straight up wielding swords was going to be a bit of a shark jump, but in execution, I think it works pretty well. Goss Harag doesn't really fight like a trained swordsman, he fights like a big brute, like an animal with giant blunt objects for forelimbs. He does have some cool personality baked into him though, the way he stalks his prey and the way he drags his weapon across the ground as he approaches a stunned hunter give off these slasher movie villain vibes vibes that I think only further cement his identity. Goss is an absolute triumph for this game. Almadron is the bigger and badder of our two new leviathans and continues the category's tradition of branching out into new liquid environments to be the master of. From the ocean to lava to the sea of the desert to the murky and muddy ponds of the deserts and rainforests, Almadron has one of the cooler designs out there. Sleek dark gray scales contrasted with an orange underbelly and yellow accents between some of his plating. I'd honestly kind of like to see him in a more vibrant game that would really let these colors pop. The gold accents are representative of a burning mucus he secretes that can dissolve the ground around him into muddy traps and sinkholes that can imprison targets. He's got an impressive ability to manipulate the mud around him, crafting it into structures, though I think they could have done a little more with this concept. Almadron doesn't have my favorite fight in the game, but he's a cool take on the Leviathan, and I love how he's animated when he's in the mud. Rakna Kadaki is an awesome new addition to the spider-like Temna Serens. She is a sum total package of several excellent ideas brought to together. Her whole body is covered in this wedding gown-esque silk armor. This armor defends her, but can be hacked away at, triggering a knockdown when enough is broken. The webbing also protects her massive abdomen, where she produces and houses her young, and generates tremendous amounts of heat. Not only can she weaponize the heat produced by her abdomen to emit a flamethrower from her mouth and superheated gases from her body, but she can also weaponize her offspring. She can tether herself to the smaller rachnoids and send herself zooming
zooming across the map at high speeds. She has a few other special interactions, such as if you are snared by her webbing and caught by a fire attack, the webbing ignites and you suffer massive damage. She also has the ability to cling to cavern ceilings, allowing her to send her flamethrower breath raining down from above. She's a super fun and multifaceted monster that simply has a lot she can do, and a varying moveset depending on the state of her armor and abdomen. She is a masterfully executed bundle of spider silk wrapped concepts packaged into one terrifying predator. Crimson Glow Volstrax is an interesting one. The only monster variant to be in a game that his core monster is not in. In lore, the Volstrax is usually pretty content to stay in the skies by itself and not bother anybody, whereas Crimson Glow is mutated into hyper aggression due to its overflowing dragon energy. I always thought this explanation was a little superfluous, kind of a need to justify why Volstrax are fighting you when they're supposed to be typically pretty secluded species, uh, even though when you fight them in Generations Ultimate, they just fight you normally. It kind of makes me feel like this could have just been Volstrax. Kind of like this justification didn't really need to be made. That being said, Crimson Glow does have some cool features of his own and expands upon Volstrax in some really awesome ways. To represent his overflowing energy, much of his body has been given new red coloration. This is especially prominent in his chest and his wings. He has pretty much all of Volstrax's core attacks and has a healthy supply of new super powerful dragon abilities. Not least of all including just a massive super laser fired from all his wings at once. He also has a really cool new ability to expel just enough of his dragon energy from his wings to maintain a hovering position. From there, he will lash out with the spear-like ends of his wings, stabbing at grounded hunters. Crimson Glow Volstrax is a welcome terror in this game, boasting probably Rise's single most challenging encounter outside of the special groups of endgame monster variations. I still gotta put in some legitimate effort in order to take him down. He's tough and was a really welcome expansion on what was already already one of Monster Hunter's coolest creatures. Wind Serpent Ibushi is our precursor to the end of the game's story, the first of the Storm Serpents that we encounter and the driver of the initial rampages in the game. Though the weaker of the species, Ibushi's still a pretty cool spectacle fight. He gets a really cool introduction, looming ominously at the end of one of the rampage waves, only to invade the last rampage mission and serve as its final boss. Eventually, he became his own event quest hunt, but for a little while, Ibushi had a pretty peculiar role as a ramp page only boss monster, which was fairly unique. He's got a great mix of wind and dragon attacks, amplifying many of his massive bursts with huge flaming geysers of the volatile dragon element. I love the almost effortlessness of him floating upside down and how unorthodox of a flying position it is. There is kind of this unearthly aspect to his mannerisms and design, backed by how casually he can conjure immense amounts of power. It's a bit disappointing that he's really just an opening act to the story's conclusion, but but I think Ibushi has some of his own merits outside of his partner. Thunder Serpent Narwa and Narwa the All-Mother are the big finale of Monster Hunter Rise, and quite the finale at that. Thunder Serpent Narwa was the original big bad of Rise, being sent careening down into a pit to wait until title update 3, where All-Mother Narwa was added to the game. I'm gonna take a guess and say that All-Mother Narwa was probably supposed to be in the base game, but had to get pushed back due to the pandemic's effects on the game development. There is no way in hell the final boss of the game was supposed to be a title update monster. That's not how these games work. In fact, I'm still a believer that Amatsu was supposed to be the last title update of Rise, not Sunbreak. The regular Narwa kind of gets a little bit overlooked due to the fact that All Mother is effectively just a better, stronger, crazier version of her, and the standard Thunder Serpent Narwa has no presence in Master Rank, which is a bit of a bummer because the original Thunder Serpent Narwa is a good fight in and of itself, and has a really solid original fight theme. Although still carrying the same ethereal and lofty personality as Ibushi, I I'd say she's maybe a touch more aggressive, firing off bolts and blasts of lightning rather than huge gusts and bursts of wind. I think I like her design a bit better than her mates as well. I love the bright, colorful yellow and orange with the little dashes of red and violet. I prefer her two backwards facing horns. I love the rows of almost rubbery looking tendrils pouring off of her body. And the egg sac on the stomach is a really cool visual touch that maybe incentivizes some somewhat barbaric strategies from the players, but again, it's a 
nice design touch. Narwa the All-Mother is the full power of both serpents made one. Both weakened, Narwa absorbs the power of Ibushi, killing him and taking on his winds as her own. And the battle is something else. Vortexes of wind and lightning, massive floating electrical rings, magnetized dragonators, huge concentrated beams of lightning, anything and everything they could think of to give to this creature. It's a tough fight, featuring a lot of relentless elemental barrages and extremely high damage. Her master rank form is an especially tough challenge still. The Rampage Apex monsters are tough to place. They are effectively watered down variations of the Deviant monsters from Generations. They lack the full move sense of the Deviants, and they have a more uniform design alteration rather than the wild looks of the Deviants. They were established as the leaders of the Rampage, frightening beasts altered by Ibushi storms and used to drive the other monsters towards Kamura Village. Eventually, they became their own separate fights and then accessories to the anomaly investigations of Master Rank. Pair that with the fact that they have no armor or gear of their own and they just kind of seem to be tacked on super monsters without much of any of their own identity. They're not bad fights or bad designs in their own right, but they have the baggage of being derivative and eventually just lost their place in the game when the Rampage was just phased out of Rise's focus. Now, onto the monsters created for Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak, the game's expansion. First off, we have Blood Orange Bishiten, a subspecies of the fruit-flinging monster from Rise's early game content. This one wields flammable pine cones, which he can ignite with his fire breath. I kinda hate to say it, but I think he's a step down from the original Bishiten. Though not a bad fight by any means, Blood Orange Bishiten simply does less than his counterpart. He's reduced to a one-track fire monster rather than a multifaceted status-heavy trickster. Now, instead of you needing to know which attack animation is capable of which effects, you know that it's just all gonna be fire explosions. He has a couple new attacks and animations that are nice, but it's... It's a shame, because I actually think I like the design of Blood Orange Bishiten quite a bit more than the standard Bishiten's color palette, and he does have a few cool new tricks that he can do with the pine cones. He just feels a little stripped down, which I don't think a subspecies should ever do. Aurora Sumnacanth might be my least favorite of Rise's new monsters. Not only do I find her to be a visual downgrade from Somnicanth, but I think she is yet another subspecies that takes away from what made her core monster special and doesn't really replace it with much. The wild contrast of her old colors is gone. She spends much more time on her four feet than swimming. Her sleep, flash, and blast are all diluted down to simply ice attacks. She's different in her attack style, but it replaces the semi-aquatic shell utilizing, shallow water swimming, sleep trapping combat style with a fairly standard grounded leviathan fighting style with maybe a little bit more agility to it than some of the other leviathans. And another thing that's always bothered me is that they took the nomenclature Aurora, one of the most singularly beautiful natural phenomena on the planet, and assigned the term to one of the least visually striking ice monsters who fights with just some of the most generic ice burst attacks that Monster Hunter has to offer. Not a fan. Magma Almadron is a pretty decent expansion on Almadron, and is probably my favorite of the four new subspecies. Rather than swimming in swampy lakes and manipulating the murky water into muddy structures, Magma Almadron casually bathes in molten lava and can manipulate molten rock into hazardous explosive formations. The mucus it secretes helps to further soften and liquefy the molten rock of the lava caverns, granting him easy traversal. I love the deep orange glow underneath his darkened scales, and he differentiates himself from Agnactor as a lava-based leviathan. There's a pretty cool spectacle to this fight as well with really good fire effects, with him leaping up freely up out of the volcanic ground to creating superheated rock formations in the wake of his movements. Also, just for the fact that it's different, it's kind of curious that Magma Almadron I think is smaller than the normal Almadron, which is interesting just in how different it is from other subspecies and variants, which typically go for the bigger, bulkier look over their original. Just an interesting detail. Pyre Rachnikadaki has a really good design, but I don't think it changes quite enough from the core Rachnikadaki for me to be wholly blown away by her. She feels like a solid expansion on what regular Rachnikadaki can do. She offers more commands to her young, she has more firepower, and now this terrifying ability to turn her head 180 degrees and charge at you backwards. She'll also extend her neck upwards, unlike a typical Rachna, and create a much more towering and menacing silhouette for herself. 
herself. Pair that with her glowing horns evocative of demons, and you have a pretty terrifying spider. And that's not even mentioning her new wardrobe of darkened and charred webbing that serves to protect her from her own explosive powder. Higher Rachna Kadaki is a pretty darn good upgrade to the original Rachna, but is perhaps not the most dramatic reinvention of the monster that I usually expect from these master rank subspecies. She almost feels a bit more like a variant than a subspecies, honestly. Espinas is not technically a new monster, but is new to us in the West and to mainline Monster Hunter as a whole, technically now being considered a fifth generation monster in the mainline series of the games. He is the poster boy of the now officially defunct Monster Hunter Frontier, and his addition to Sunbreak was a completely unexpected and welcome surprise. He looks phenomenal in this newer engine, his red thorns and forest green hide working together much better now than they did in his original model. He's got kind of a barbarian tank type of attack style, using his huge bulk and defensive plating with his high speed and strength, and to make matters worse, he's got a very unique mixture of fire, poison, and paralysis all mixed together in every single fireball he spouts. I'm really hoping that he's a sign of great things to come from the world of once thought lost Monster Hunter titles, and he's just a phenomenal inclusion by his own merits. Garengolm is the first of the three lords, the monsters of focus in Sunbreak, and the first play with the theme of classic horror monsters. Based loosely on Frankenstein's monster, Garengolm is the largest of the monkey monsters, by a sizable margin, and is this hulking colossus of staggering strength. His body produces a sap that both stimulates plant growth and can allow him to attach pieces of stone to his forelimbs, one coated in a soaking mossy rock, the other in molten stone. I always love monsters who combo their elements, and Garengolm does so in a magnificent fashion, now backing every single blow with a huge burst of elemental output, creating massive geysers of water and propelling himself up into the air with explosions, using both at the same time to create massive blasts of superheated steam. He is an excellent mid-tier monster. Lunagaron is the werewolf-inspired member of the Three Lords, and he's got a pretty awesome take on the shape-shifting myth. Typically, he's a quadrupedic canine who can travel great distances and live in several habitats due to an internal organ that regulates his body temperature and keeps him cool. He has the ability, however, to shut this organ down, expelling massive amounts of coolant, which then solidifies into armor. This process also expands his muscles great, allowing him to fight on two legs. This completely alters his fight, swapping it from a fast-paced encounter against a wild beast into a brutal duel against a savage and precise fighter. I think he is a fantastic reinterpretation of some of Frontier's stance-shifting monsters, although I think he could maybe use a few more attacks. His outstanding design and impressive shape-shifting mechanic make for an excellent monster. Malzino represents the king of the legendary horror monsters, the Vampire, and is the flagship of Sunbreak. Malzino is graceful, regal, savage, menacing, dark, and twisted, a corrupted version of a noble species who has taken on a symbiotic relationship with the affliction-bringing Kirio in order to weaken his ancient foe. Malzino is a runaway hit for Sunbreak, and for good reason. His involvement with Sunbreak's story is excellent and tragic. His design is sleek and magnificent communicating the dread grandeur that a vampire should radiate. His moveset is fun to engage with, and his bloodening form adds an extra level of sinister darkness to the encounter. With the added context of his final form that we'll talk about in a bit, Malzino is quickly rising to be one of my favorite monsters of all time. Scorned Magnamalo is the edgier, badassier, explodier, violentier version of the edgy, badass, exploding, and violent Magnamalo. This is a no-nonsense kill-on-sight version of Magnamalo that no longer cares about scoping out hunting opportunities or cultivating territory. The loss of his horn has made him a social pariah amongst his kin, and though this would be a death sentence amongst most of the species, those who push themselves to the limits rise above to become scorned. Totally alone and self-sufficient, his blades always extended and his serrated armor always at the ready, his hellfire in his pink states constantly, his scales darker and accented now by glowing red veins. He opens every fight with the regular Magnamalo's ultimate attack 
Spike. I prefer actually how Scorn Spikes are handled rather than the regular Magnamalos. The standard Magnamalo will have these elongated spines come shooting up out of his back, and personally, I think they look a little scattershot and silly. Scorned Magnamalo keeps his spikes in the lower position, but now they're much more sharp and serrated. Somehow it's a little bit cleaner looking than the original monster. He's a good fight too, boasting a lot of dramatic augmentations to Magnamalo's moveset, as well as a further state of heat where his flames can burn bright red on some attacks and trigger dragon blight. There's also a potentially cool story tidbit where the scorned Magnamalo you fight in the story is believed to be the same Magnamalo from the Rampage 50 years ago, who wiped out the original Kimura village and was driven off by some of the characters when they were younger. Though, they don't really do much of anything with that, unfortunately. Geismagorm is the final boss of Sunbreak and the beast behind the calamity known as the Affliction. He is the host controlling the Curio Swarm and siphons the life force they drain from their victims to add to his own immense power. The only thing preventing his rise to the surface is the presence of Malzino, who takes the power of the Curio for his own. But when you get rid of Malzino, you unwittingly return the Curio to their far more dangerous master, a hulking, subterranean abomination not referred to as a monster or an animal or a creature, but as a demon, the Archdemon of the Abyss. A living devastation that should never see the light of day, and it's a justified fear that he garners. The Affliction is one of the single most dangerous natural events we've witnessed in Monster Hunter, and Geismagorm's strength in its own is immense. The life force the Curio gather for him calcifies into blood-colored crystals all over his body, which when destroyed release huge jets of flame constantly pouring out of the vents in his arms and his back. He uses his massive strength and the ability to produce gigantic blood-infused fireballs and explosive beams to reduce targets to ash. He is the impetus of one of Monster Hunter's coolest stories, most badass cutscenes, and most climactic battles. Though I do think he could actually be a little bit more difficult. Guys of Bagorm does everything that a good Monster Hunter final boss should do. Flaming Espinas is a reinvention of the Espinas subspecies from Frontier. He's given some excellent orange action to saturate his brown shell, and he's a welcome overhaul of the regular Espinas. Not only is he granted a new super move in the form of a supercharged, damn near one-hit guaranteed kill fireball, not only is the paralysis of his fire attacks replaced with defense down, which is terrifying in this fight, but he has a pretty noticeable roster of new moves and new combos and that the regular Espinas just doesn't have. He feels like a legitimately new fight, while also being very recognizable as an Espinas. I'd say he he might be one of, if not my favorite fight in Sunbreak. And quick aside, if it sounds like I'm being more positive about flaming Espinas for being an upgrade with mild differentiation than I am with Pyrachna Kadaki, who is effectively the same type of subspecies for Rachna, it's because flaming Espinas hails from an era where less dramatic changes and reinvention were the norm for subspecies. Violet Mizutsune is a phenomenal monster despite a few things working against it. Yes, at this point Sunbreak had way too many fire monsters in it. Yes, there were too many fire subspecies and too many fire title update monsters. Yes, there was an arguably much better choice for a Mizutsune variation in this game in the Thunderbubble Mizutsune, which would have legitimized Monster Hunter Explore and further reinforced the idea that these non-mainline Monster Hunter games were getting love again. But damn it, Violet Mizutsune is still one of Rise and Sunbreak's best monsters. The bubbles and fluids expelled from Violet Mizutsune are filled with flammable gases that can ignite just from even the slightest application of friction. A Violet Mizutsune wraps itself in pale blue flames while it sets the arena around it ablaze, its body igniting the fluids it leaks onto the ground. The battle is gorgeous and harrowing. He is a tough opponent to put down, his attacks hit hard, his pressure is unyielding, and his barrages of physical attacks and Flung seeking bubble projectiles are a constant threat. Violet Muzutsune continues to solidify the rare species as the greatest monster variation category that Monster Hunter has. Primordial Malzino is the true ending of Sunbreak, a Malzino yet to be fully tainted by the Curio Affliction. Yes, his fight by itself is rather spectacular, but that first quest with him just hit 
different. With Guy Spagorm vanquished, the Curio desperately seek out this new host and go for a yet uncorrupted Malzino, knowing that this dragon is compatible with them. I'll talk a little bit more about the narrative of this first fight a little bit later on. Here, I want to focus on Primordial Malzino just as his own creature. I love that he's a lot bulkier than the original Malzino, his vitality having not been constantly drained by the swarm. I love how he fights with his massive wings as a shield and lance, combining massive armored rushes with long-ranged wing strikes and tail stabs. And as he fights, the Curio gradually take over his mind and body, making him faster and more brutal, extending the combos of the original Malzino and weaving in these moves alongside the more heavy strikes of the Primordial version, creating a massive and expanding move pool of rapid-fire attacks. And in his final state, he becomes a ceaseless berserker, launching a non-stop flurry of attack after attack after attack that you must run away from or outmaneuver. It's a grueling challenge with an insane progression that pushes the Malzino fight in a godly direction. My question with Malzino going forward is what version of them they'd use if he ever gets brought into another Monster Hunter game. Will they use the afflicted Malzino that we fight in the game, or the untainted original form of the monster that we dub Primordial Malzino, who is technically the authentic form of the species? I'm not sure, but if the Magalas have taught us anything, it's that when these very story-related monsters are brought into titles after the ones they featured in, best to be a little bit irreverent of their story implications and simply enjoy the fact that they're there. The Risen Elder Dragons solve pretty much all the problems that the Rampage Apex monsters had. They are a universal variation like the Rampage Apexes, however, they are not derivatives of any previous monster variation. They have their own armor sets, and they aren't tied to a game mode that faded out as the game progressed. They also have their own quests and master rank, and aren't relegated to tagalongs in investigations. Each of the Risen Elder Dragons are fantastically redesigned, with burning bright new decorations. They are each brutally difficult fights with their own super moves, massive new additions to their attack pools, tons of health and damage, and they push the super fast, counter heavy, and ultra aggressive rise hunters to their limits. They are perfect challenges for this game. As for returning monsters, we're going to go over them a lot more quickly. First of all, there's a lot of third generation love here, which I very much appreciate. Great Baggy and Ruggy are brought in to make the Dog Wyverns the core raptors for this game. Volvadon, Lagambi, and Arzuros reintroduce the whole bear trio, which make for some charming early game opponents. Royal Ludroth, Baroth, and Baryoth are all old favorites of mine from Try as well. We get a decent amount of first and second generation monsters like Kezu, Basarios, Diablos, Rajang, Furious Rajang, Daimyo, Hermitar, and Shogun Sienatar. Of course, we have the ever-present Rathalos and Rathian. It's awesome to get the proper Elder Dragon Trinity back together, with Teostra, Kushaladora, and Camellios after Camellios' absence in Worlds. And may I say, this is the best Kushala's ever been by a mile. We have a lot of the classic flagships here, like Tigrex, Zenogre, and Nargakuga, as well as a very welcome heavy representation of fourth generation flagships in the form of Gormagala and his family of Shigaru Magala and Chaotic Gormagala, Seregios, Misutsune, and Astalos. The rare species category got a bit of love with Silver Rathlos and Gold Rathian, mainstays of every Monster Hunter expansion, as well as the fantastic return of Lucent Nargakuga. We also got a really welcome layer of world representation, including Jiratotis, Puki Puki, Tobi Kadachi, Andronath, Basil Geese, Seething Basil Geese, Kulu Yaku, and Velkana. And to top off the game with a phenomenal final spectacle challenge, we got a wholly reimagined Amatsu that reigns as one of the most awe-inspiring duels Monster Hunter has has ever produced. All in all, a pretty phenomenal roster of 78 total bosses, with just about every single entry feeling unique, warranted, engaging, and a blast to fight against. I'm pretty damn happy with the end results of this game's rogues gallery. Let's move on to the maps now. Gotta have some fun locales to fight this massive entourage of monsters, of course. And we got another pretty solid selection of wide-spanning traditional arenas and single-segment boss arenas to cover. Starting out with the main map of the game, we have the Shrine Ruins, a quaint bamboo forest that has grown over a dilapidated old human settlement and sacred shrine. The map is dotted with long-abandoned structures that can be run on or destroyed, pathways shaded by a tall canopy of bamboo trees, a river flowing from the top of the mountains towards the back of the map, creating waterfalls as it goes and pools towards the beginning of the map. Several smaller mountains and hills to scale and leap between, and a large, singular mountain peak that pierces the heart of the map. 
It's a bit easy to take this map for granted. Though, yes, it does have its share of unique features, I think we may have grown rather accustomed to starter forest maps, and we're at the shrine ruins so often throughout the game. At least, I kind of felt that way. I know I certainly thought it was a bit of a whatever map after a little while of playing, but I think the Shrine Ruins deserves a little bit better than that. Additionally, I think the Shrine Ruins are a great way to catapult the player into exploring the game mechanics. I think the large mountain and the several other ones dotting the upper levels of the map allow you to do exactly what you would want to do with the wire bugs the second you have them. Having these new tools, you would want to go climb up high places and run up the tallest thing in the game only to go jump off of it. And you get to have that fun right off the rip. I still very fondly remember the demo for Rise right when it came out, and seeing what was possible and what could be climbed and how fast you could do it. I love that the Shrine Ruins, simply by its design, invites you to explore and enjoy what makes Rise special. The wire bugs are not my favorite thing in Monster Hunter ever, as I've described, but I really appreciate that the game was built around them, from the combat to the level design. It made wire bugs really feel like they belonged and weren't just a gimmick of the day. And I think the Shrine Ruins exemplifies that and really entices you to explore the peaks of this ability. Some of my favorite zones include the Ruined Shrine Building and its Guardian Wall Gate in Zone 9, the spillover of murky, swampy mud water from 9 into the larger pond of it in Air Area 10, the top of the waterfall up in 13 with a tower built into the mountainside, the bridge connecting it to the other mountains that you can run on, and the view from all the way up here on the map, looking out over everything. It's a great starter map. Has this air of ancestry, of mystery, the whole place shrouded in a bit of fog. It feels ancient, a little tragic as you can see what once was, but still brimming with life and overgrown with the natural world, that things still thrive here in this place where humans once dwelled, doesn't make it necessarily abandoned. I think it has an excellent feel of mysticism to it. Definitely a map that I think, at least I underrated, for a long period of time. I really like the Shrine Ruins. It grew on me, then kind of fell off for me as I got used to it, and then grew on me again as I went back and really opted to appreciate it. Next up is our ice map of the game, the Frost Islands. I will be honest here, not my favorite favorite ice map of all time, though one of the greatest Monster Hunter maps of all time is an ice map, so that isn't exactly fair. I think my biggest gripe with the Frost Islands is that 5 out of its 12 zones are wholly or heavily dedicated to this one huge flat lake of shallow water that has not a ton of differentiating terrain from zone to zone, and two more zones in caves have their own flat watery ponds as well. What makes the water sections in the Shrine Ruins so cool was the differentiating terrain caused by the flowing series of waterfalls, and the occasional inclusion of elevated areas to add a little bit of extra combat differentiation. There was more of a reason why these watery sections existed, and they're sequestered over to really kind of the left third of the map, as opposed to the majority of it, which is what happens with the Frost Islands here. What else is weird is that there's only really one or two monsters on the map that that make use of all this shallow water. And I, I don't even think Aurora Somnicanth uses it all that much. I think it's really just Somnicanth. There's a bit of odd monster placement here too. Acnosome, Tetronodon, and Great Izuchi all feel kind of a little out of place here. I'm sure it's written somewhere in their ecology why they have cold temperature adaptations, but they just... They don't look like they really super belong here. Heck, I don't even think Somnicanth looks half as good here as she does in the Flooded Forest, and she's introduced in this zone. It doesn't ruin anything for me, but I see bright green big Tetronodon in the deep blue Frost Islands, and I think, what the hell are you doing here? So, on to the good stuff, though, because there's also a lot of good stuff. Some of the scenery here is great. The wrecked hunting ship suspended up in the air by ice structures, the frozen Zora Magdros skull in the heart of the map, the two icy caverns, the snow-covered trees, the teeth-like rock formations sticking up out of the ground, and, of course, 
the monk snail. There's even some unique animal interactions here, with these roaming groups of tiny cephalopods that give you buffs when you touch them. I think some of the best visual storytelling in the maps in this game are on the frozen islands, with the frozen remains of an ancient battle between a hunting ship and this mountainous dragon. Some of my favorite zones here include this nice elevated yet kind of narrow section in area one with the highest density of the snowy trees. They don't put too many big monster battles here, so it's kind of a nice scenic area that doesn't feel too confused or too cramped. And it's not all that remarkable, but I kind of just like the shift from the very wide open flat zones in this map to a nice elevated, narrow outlook. I just think it's a nice change of scenery, and it's a bit underutilized. Area 12, though pretty basic layout wise, is a pretty cool looking cave with a single skylight opening, peering down into this dark watery cavern. The light illuminates the fang-like stalactites covering the whole ceiling, and I really like Zone 9. It's probably the most cinematic zone on the map with a few elevation tiers and this one nice big mesa overlooking the whole zone with a huge ice wall behind it. Final battles with Kishala Deora and Magna Malo here because this is typically where they nest are pretty satisfying to fight here. Next, we have the first of three, kind of four maps that were remade from a prior Monster Hunter game. And I'll talk about this concept in general real quick because I think it's another fantastic decision on Ryze's part, one of their more inspired choices. There's a lot of excellent maps in the old Monster Hunter games, don't get me wrong. Some maps that I still love in spite of the massive enhancements a world brought to the concept of map structure. To bring some of these classic maps into the new style, making them seamless and filled with stuff in between the zones is such a fantastic choice that is nostalgic and purposeful. This adds even more life and variety to these older maps that were always really cool and really good and had excellent art design, but were just limited by the technology of the classic games. Honestly, it's because of this idea that I would be perfectly fine with Monster Hunter not going back to the New World continent anytime soon. I want to see the Ancestral Steeps, or Volcano from Try, or Forest and Hills, or Ruined Pinnacle reimagined like this. Anyways, the Flooded Forest. Probably my third favorite map from Try is back, and it's pretty darn cool this time around. They use an excuse of it currently being a dry season to justify water levels being much lower, new areas being accessible, and old areas being inaccessible. By the nature of the Flooded Forest being a water map, it was not going to be the most faithfully recreated, but they have recaptured a lot of the old classic, including the waterfalls overlooking the rivers that were once Area 7, and now Area 11, the old Leviathan nest on a raised platform in an underground watery cave that was once Area 8 and is now Area 14, and the watery zones at the edge of the maps are still Areas 5 and 6, though brought back down to ground, once fully accessible via swimming, now focused on standard ground combat. And there's probably a handful of other great examples. It can be a little bit tough to decipher because this map has changed quite a bit, but once where the banks of the forest rivers are now cliffs and mesas that overlook the quaint little waterways below. What were once these filled-in, submerged rivers that you once swam through are now pathways in between these rocky valleys that have been cut by the water. It's amazing to see what some of these old sites reimagined and recontextualized look like. Additionally, there's famous landmarks like the waterfalls that can now be run up, leapt to, and interacted with, expanding the zone beyond what was previously possible. Some favorite zones for me include areas 11 and 9, elevated overlooks gazing upon the old rivers and waterfalls, with plenty of ledges to get thrown off of and sent hurtling to the depths of the map. I, I really like zones where I can be thrown off cliffs, they're kind of fun. And Area 4, one of the former rivers, now this narrow valley between the raised sections of the map. Something about it feels nice and dense and compact and dangerous. It's a common traveling point for a lot of the flooded forest aquatic predators. Standing down there in that one little area, it feels almost kind of claustrophobic, kind of in a good way. You feel lost, like you're right in the depths and the heart of this jungle, even though the exit's like 200 feet away. I really like this reinterpretation and expansion upon the old flooded forest. Our next reimagined map is another one of Tri's old locations, the desert map of the third generation, the Sandy Plains. And damn, dude. Damn, this may have gone from my second least or absolute least favorite map from Tri, although I certainly never really hated it, to 
maybe my favorite map in Rise, and man, that might be included in Sunbreak too. And you know what else? I still might like the Wildspire Waste even better than this map. People don't talk enough about Monster Hunter maps, man. I, I swear, these places are great. Whereas the Flooded Forest was masterfully reverse engineered and reinterpreted to fit a game that lacks the underwater component of Try, with the Sandy Plains, dude, it's all here. Though interestingly, turned about 30 degrees clockwise. Not really sure why, but kind of interesting. And when I say it's all here, dude, it's all here. The giant anthill pillars, the narrow little nook where Great Jackie would nest, the mud pond right in the middle of everything for Baroth, this smaller, higher up area where not a lot of boss monsters would go that overlooks the whole landscape, the sand bridge that connects two big desert zones, the underground caverns where Diablos would sleep that you have to jump down into, and now they're so much larger and much more expansive, and you can see all the way down into them from from the desert up above and ah oh, man it's so good they added some old desert ruins in the spaces in between the battle zones added a couple of new fighting zones here and there to flush out the map a little bit like a new mud hole for almadron and baroth there's new levels of elevation and cliffs and rocks and swamps to change up the combat a little bit here and there there's sinkholes out in the desert there's way more passages and tunnels that lead deep into the depths of the map the combat here feels really good the map looks great it plays great it's nice and vast and wide with a decent variety it just feels great to hunt here. Some favorite zones for myself include kind of all of them, but <laughs> I really like combat in all of these zones. The OG Baroth mud hole in Area 7 is a really good one. Not too big, not too small, with a few boulders to dodge around and some nice scenery. Area 8, which always kind of turn into this traffic congested cluster of an area with several monsters bashing into one another into walls and into giant anthills that one's a lot of fun and then area 12 which is one of the underground caverns now given this almost kind of like buried coliseum feel to it considering the multi-tiered levels of raised ground surrounding the main battlefield this place is awesome Finally, for our major maps, in main game Rise, we have the Lava Caverns, which is a pretty unusual volcano map. Half of it is your traditional mountainous volcanic traversal, and the other half are these water-filled caverns leading outside to some exterior wetlands outside of the fire-spewing mountain. It's a pretty unique concept, and although I am itching for an almost exclusively volcanic map like Tries Again, this map does have a lot to love, and some of my favorite sections in any volcano map they've made. On the right side of the map, you have two sets of areas. The first are a series of cliffs, crags, and shelves that scale up along the outer levels of the volcano, getting higher and higher as the mountain inclines. And within are a few zones dedicated to the lava caverns themselves, large, expansive caves illuminated by freely flowing lava. On the left side of the map, the place hard cuts to a series of watery pathways that lead outside to the foot of the mountain. Buried deep within the caverns are the skeletal remains of one of the storm serpents, or a relative of them. It's a neat alternative take on a volcano volcano map, and there are some really cool areas down here, but I do think I prefer the map design and combat on the volcanic half of the map. Fun fact, I think this is the only map in the game where I prefer the lighting at night over the day. I don't always love how night looks in this game, but when you're outside, the volcano at night, all the glowing orange and red and yellow looks really nice. Area 13 is one of my favorites here. It is the mouth of the lava caverns and a passageway into the mountain. It also gives this feeling of fighting on a bridge, which is another thing I'd love more of in Monster Hunter. With both sides of the passageway being lowered down a bit, it creates a nice narrow and a really epic feeling battleground where you aren't given a ton of wiggle room. Honestly, I kind of like Area 3 as well. It's pretty plain, a bit of a flooded battleground outside of the mountain with a few reeds sticking out here and there. But there's something just kind of neat about dueling in a flat open battle zone at the foot of a mountain with other volcanoes erupting in the distance. It's got a really nice kind of cinematic feel to it. Not the most gameplay diverse battle zone that they have, but it does kind of have this honorable duel vibe to it. My favorite zone in the Lava Caverns, one of my favorites in Monster Hunter just flat out, is Area 5. A huge pool of lava in the middle for the fight to rage around. Giant stone pillars to to bash into, several ledges to leap off of, small monster interference, cliffs to be batted off of, multiple entrances for other monsters to appear from, endemic life buffs. There is a ton of combat variety and coolness just stuffed 
packed in here to make such a cool combat arena that doesn't feel too cluttered. The lava draining down is the centerpiece for the whole battle area. The only thing that could maybe make this better is that the lava pool in the middle didn't have this invisible wall cylinder around us so us and the monster could leap over and fly between and whatnot. But it's so good and so climactic feeling. A battle right in the core of a volcano. It doesn't get much better than that. Moving on into Sunbrick, we have yet another ported over map, this being the second generation jungle, and I gotta tell ya, this is borderline the exact same map from the old PSP games, but with the seamlessness and extra bells and whistles that Sunbreaks allows, and it is wild to see how insanely accurate to the original vision this map is. There's only a few new areas, and pretty much everything else is in the exact same configuration, numbered the exact same way, structured exactly the same, and a range the same. It is the most one-to-one -one accurate of these three ported maps, and this is very likely due to the fact that the jungle was never particularly complicated. It's a big ring of jungly grassy areas around a mountain, and within the mountain is a bunch of cave systems that you fight in. Very easy to reconstruct, I would imagine. And the place looks beautiful. This was another old favorite of mine, and even though Rise already had ported a rainforest-esque map, the jungle still feels like a great choice. There's a few new additions here, including extension of the western beach and a creation of an interior for the temple in Area 10. This interior is sick, by the way, and I would love more Monster Hunter maps with buildings to be interacted with and interiors to fight in. I think that would be a really cool step going forward. Caves are awesome, but I would kill to have Monster Hunter fights in and around large, huge, complex human structures, battling monsters like Gormagala and Kashaladora in the depths of the ancient human temple is exactly what I have wanted for a long time, and the jungle map gives us this, so more of this, please. There's some cool other stuff in here as well, like secret islands that you can go to, the ability to climb the giant tree in the middle of the map, stuff like that. Just stuff that this new expansion of the map into Sunbreak with this new map philosophy allows that you could never have done with the original jungle. The new bottom half of Area 10 is obviously a favorite here of mine, as I've already discussed. I also really like Area 3 in the upper half of 10, with the two pretty much blending together. I love fighting on the beach here, and making the water shallow so that you can fight in it just lets the whole area breathe and open up a little bit more. I really like the new Area 11, which is another fight on the beach that has plenty of space and maneuverability to it. And Area 2 is another solid one. Very simple, has good scenery, feels nice and open, and I think it's a perfect size. Not claustrophobic and not too vast. It is remarkable how fresh and how familiar the jungle feels in Sunbreak. It is almost exactly as I remember it, and yet has so many new bells and whistles. It was really cool to have this one ported. As, as much as I really adore the changes and alterations and new aspects that the Sandy Plains and the Flooded Forest got, seeing the jungle just given a pure facelift, not too much brand new, it was really cool to see just a full reinterpretation of this map. Last and certainly not least is Sunbreak's baby the Citadel. Ooh, man, this is a monster of a map. Definitely in contention for my favorite map in Rise, and probably has a safe spot in my all-time top 10, maybe top 5. This behemoth is basically three maps in one, and somehow, someway, kind of works. It's built around the three Lords of Sunbreak. A luscious green forest for Garen Golm takes up much of the south and southwestern portions of the map. A razor-sharp icy mountain range in the north and northwest is the territory of Lunagaron, and in the east, within the obliterated citadel itself, is the throne of Malzino. It had to have been a tough balancing act to get three equal spaces and to design the arch in a way that they don't clash too hard. Upon looking at the citadel, they use a couple of tricks to try and make this work. They use proximity to nearby snowy mountains and steeper inclines to show the region's rapid shift from one biome to another, showing the inclines in the forest gradually getting steeper and steeper until the incline allows the snow to take over. Additionally, they blend the elements of both of these regions to make the transition feel a little bit more natural. As you go upwards and into the north, the long wild grass starts to thin, the dirt trails turn to stone, and the greenery begins to diminish. In 
some of the lower snow areas, the snow is in little clusters and clumps with some stone floor still showing, but towards the top of the map, the northmost sections, the snow completely takes over the ground. These artistic choices help make the Citadel feel a little bit less jarring and serve to create a very unique map that blends two of the very common archetypes and an all new one to make a map that is entirely its own. Very reminiscent to why the Coral Highlands and Rotten Vale work so well in World. There just hadn't up to that point been anything that existed quite like them. The Citadel shares this advantage. The titular Citadel itself sits tucked off to the east, removed from nature, ever so slightly. At least it was while it properly stood. There is a ton to enjoy and explore here. The moat of the citadel, buried chambers and tunnels beneath the castle, elements of a town and other fortifications within the region, smashed up structures to run on, swamps, frost caves, mountaintops, walls, castles, gates, rolling hills. There's a ton, so much density to one of Monster Hunter's largest maps, and it is a hauntingly beautiful map too. The abandoned and brutalized fortress looming over the first zones of the map, and the icy peaks towering even higher over that. The dazzling frozen regions and rich green forests are both filled with color and varied terrain and landmarks. Some favorite areas include the old fortress gateway in Area 3, right in the middle of where this community once was. It's now a torn up battleground and a bit of confined space that can be tough to find good placement in. Due to its smaller size, I often have fights spill over up into the Citadel or over into Area 4 or over the bridge back into Area 2. It's cool to fight right in the heart of this old settlement. Area 13 is an awesome and very advantageous area. It's got a decent size to it and it's right in the midst of the woods. It also has this huge swamp of sap that if utilized can keep a monster knocked down for a prolonged period of time. Area 7 is an amazing battleground to fight monsters like Shigaru and Gormagala and Volstrax in. It's the very top of the map, on top of the nearest snowy mountains, with the rest of the range looming over the backdrop. It is memorable and an excellently sized battleground that feels like fighting a foe at the top of the world. It has some ledges and destructible objects that keep the combat interesting too, though full props absolutely go to Area 14, the old citadel itself, the ripped open remains of the old castle, the corrupted seat of power for Malzino, and the place where you duel the vampire dragon to the death. It is the perfect battleground, a small, tight, flat box where it's just you and your foe barely giving each other an inch. It's intense, cinematic, climactic, and significant to the story of this place. I would say that even over the Frost Islands, which dictate an entire battle of a hunting ship versus a mountain dragon, that the best visual storytelling is probably here in the Citadel. There are no bad maps in Rise, not by a long shot. There's some clear winners here, but everyone has something to bring to the table, from masterfully recreated classics like the Sandy Plains and Jungle, to interesting twists on old archetypes like the Lava Caverns and Shrine Ruins, to mold-breaking creations like the Citadel. The maps of Rise are fascinating, storied, complex, well thought out, stuffed with abundance of awesome battle zones intriguing endemic life, secret collectibles, hidden zones, and tons of cool little details between the main areas. There are places in which Rise's map design, I think, even outdoes World, and place where the game feels more vibrant, diverse, multi-layered, and alive than its predecessor. There are even journal entries, tall tales, and the like that can be gathered around the maps to tell the stories of what happened in these places, and offer context to the doom that befell certain people, or to past cultures now long gone. Magnificent magnificent work and effort was put into all of these. Now, as for the single zone boss arenas, they're mostly pretty good. I will say, I'm getting sick of fighting the big final boss monster in caves and caverns and sinkholes. I get guys Magorm, he's a demon rising from the underworld, but and I get that All Mother Narwa is in her nest, but you really put the Storm Queen in a hole underground. This is coming off of the backs of fighting the Jivas and Alatrion and Kolvtaroth all in holes and tunnels and caves in World of Iceborn. I, outside, please. Cities, please. City sieges, please. There's not too much to say about Geismagorms or All Mother Narwa's boss arenas. They're huge, rocky pits. I do like that Geismagorms is multi tiered and you grab actually like, push him back down into the core of the earth. That's kind of cool. Uh, very indicative of Safi Jiva, though. The other two single arena battle zones, though, the Forlorn Arena and the Infernal Springs, those are pretty excellent. Very atmospheric.
atmospheric, have a grand sense of finality to them. The Infernal Springs has some decent variety to it, with a massive wall in the back, shallow water, slopes, endemic life, and pillars that can be used defensively. It has a sense of grim finality to it, a battle arena soaked in blood-red water, surrounded by the dilapidated and eviscerated remains of some great fortress or kingdom of old. The sun never shines, and the surrounding mountains are desolate rock. I've heard speculation that this was once the kingdom that the Amatsu of Sunbreak destroyed, and unless it's been disproven, it's a theory that I find somewhat compelling. The whole map just feels sinister and foreboding, more so than most other maps that aren't overt final boss arenas. The Forlorn Arena, on the other hand, is another remade map, a remake of one of the original tower maps, a remnant of a past civilization shrouded in legend, mystery, fog, and moonlight. It lacks the Infernal Springs gameplay variety, though it does have some ledges, walls, and endemic life and stuff like that, but it's a very simple box arena that feels perfectly sized and looks beautiful at night. Both are incredible maps, dark, imposing zones that set excellent stages for some of the more challenging battles that Sunbreak and Rise have to offer, though I do think they become very overused at the end of the Anomaly Investigation grinding. They become kind of crutch stages to expedite combat, which made them and the end game of Sunbreak a little bit less special in my eyes. It also comes down to the fact that the big rainbow spear birds are in these zones all the time for every quest that'll be here, so players would usually kind of just default to going to these maps because they didn't have to waste time collecting spear birds. This is something I mentioned a little while ago in that section as I kind of didn't like what the spear birds did to the end game for Sunbreak as it necessitated moving away from the big natural maps into these tight little boss arenas and kind of turned the end game of Sunbreak into a boss rush. Uh, that's a game design issue, not a map or an art design issue. Still a big fan of these two, definitely aesthetically and playing in them. Now, let's talk about the two maps that, although we don't fight on them, they are absolutely just as important as our battlegrounds, our place of rest and relaxation and preparation for the fights ahead, the villages. Monster Under Rise has two very different villages that do two very different things, and I think they do what they set out to do extremely well. Kamura first. Rise is the first Monster Under Village that for me, successfully created the immersive feeling of being within a fully developed, functioning, and populated village community. Other villages are excellent and simply didn't have the technology and resources and size that Rise has. Absolutely. But Rise having access to these things allows it to feel like it houses more than 11 people, and there's a fair bit more to the place than just your hunting facilities. There's a number of buildings and NPCs and little areas that serve no really greater purpose than to populate, flush out, and immerse one in Kamura Village. The place feels like it's thriving and functioning as a village without you, and not simply as a springboard designed predominantly to fling you into the wilderness to go slaughter animals. There's buildings that only exist for you to play around on and wirebug mechanic around on. There's market stalls that don't do anything for you, but shows you what these people eat and sell and trade, and there's small little nooks and crannies that exist just to be explored, and there's a chunk of Kamura that you can't even go to, but considering the cool small details and the part that you can go to, one's imagination kind of fills in the gaps as to what stuff lies beyond the invisible wall. Kimura is a lot larger and denser with ultimately inconsequential details than it has any functional need to be, and I think that's to its benefit. Not only does a game with all this vertical movement and speed deserve a hub that allows you to flex that muscle and play around with that tool and scratch that itch, but as stated earlier, it simply helps Kimura feel alive. As for the facility, you are interested in, they're all pretty centralized right at the heart of the village where the two main roads intersect. Village quests, your item box, eating, forging, buddy management, mail, item purchasing, and melding are all located within a few feet of one another, centralizing much of your necessities and letting the rest of Kimura just spread out. Kimura expands even further with the buddy plaza, hunter's hub, and training grounds. If the main village wasn't large enough, you have these three sub areas that serve their own functions. The buddy plaza is built onto its own small island and is predominantly Predominantly, one big training course for your palicos and palamutes to train on in between missions. It also houses Rondine's huge stockpile of trade goods. If I had one nitpick about Kimura, it would be that about a third of the utilities are on this island, away from all the other centralized hunting tools and vendors, the two separated by a quick sprint 
it's in a tiny loading screen. Two loading screens if you're in multiplayer. Though the run is pretty negligible, honestly. It's just a quick little jaunt. The Hunter's Hub is a pretty standard multiplayer guild hall. Nothing wrong with it, but it is simple. As opposed to the larger village, the hub is enclosed and denies wire bug use. There's also no mini games or fun interactions in this hub. It's pretty strictly utilitarian in terms of mechanics in it, though it does have a cool aesthetic. It has its own buddy managing and forging in a separate upstairs location as well. I have nothing against this hub. I've just seen bigger, better, and more innovative. Thankfully, Rise did make an excellent change to have other hunters be visible outside of the gathering hub, showing up in any other aspect of the village that you're in, and they can join quests from these other areas too. In just about every other Monster Hunter game out there, at least all the ones I can think of, other players only show up in your quest hub, a decision I never understood and am super glad to see rectified. The training area in Rise is pretty phenomenal, dare I say, perfect, honestly. I'm so glad they started implementing these training zones in these games, and this one annihilates World's Training Arena by an exponential degree. In World, you had a log you could beat up or a cart with some barrels you could beat up, as well as some slopes, vines, and slinger ammo to try out a few of the game's mechanics. That was fine, did what it needed to do. We've desperately been needing training areas like this so new players can try out weapons and so we can test out sets. Rise's training area does all that and more. There's a big mechanical tetronodon, some moving targets, some siege weapons, and a huge amount of spaces and ledges and suspended bridges for you to zip around on. The Tetronodon Automaton has different hit zones, status susceptibility, the ability to track you, raise and lower its head, and attack you with projectiles and foot stomps. These are all customizable options, and it lets you test your positioning, counter and block timing, damage numbers, status output, and helps you to not be too greedy. This place is fantastically crafted and is a phenomenal asset for testing new skills, new builds, new weapons, and their switch skills and silk binds. You can even set infinite wire bugs so you can just endlessly practice with them. It's hard to think of really anything missing from this training area. There's also your room, which is pretty inconsequential, honestly, pretty small and not accessible to other players, but you can change the music around here, play some collectible figures on shelves, and hang up some of your own in-game pictures on the wall. So there's some neat little features in here. Kimura is beautifully crafted. It's fun to explore for a little while. It feels lively, thriving, and cultured. Even if it's predominantly a very recognizably Japanese derivative culture, its utilities are grouped pretty well for the most part. It's open enough to let you stretch your legs. It accommodates for the new gameplay features in Rise, and it's just pleasant to look at and experience. The structures are dark in color and stand tall, powerful, a necessary detail considering Kimura has seen hardship and danger before and must be able to defend itself. However, these dark sentinel walls, towers, and buildings are offset by tons of bright color in the forms of flags, banners, market stalls, artwork, lanterns, and plant life. The village is surrounded by bright green trees, verdant mountains, and deep blue waters. Kimura feels safe, secure, and mighty, but also welcoming, warm, and storied. It is a gorgeous place, and I I am happy that we spent so much time here. But I think Komura is one of the best, most immersive, and lived-in feeling Monster Hunter villages ever crafted. Elgato is possibly the best put-together multiplayer hub that Monster Hunter has to offer. Elgato is substantially smaller and simpler than Komura, but does not lack its small secret areas, sense of livelihood, and high places to zip to and climb on that Komura has. Elgato is a military outpost built to face off against the building threat of the Affliction and its hosts. So it makes sense that this place is less elaborate than a civilian village. Far and away what makes Elgato so superior to what came before it, at least in terms of gameplay, is the complete lack of loading screens. And there's a few reasons for that. Let me explain what I'm saying here. There is absolutely no division whatsoever between single player and multiplayer in Elgato. No village and hub quests, no separate hub behind a loading screen or in a different game menu. You can do everything with your friends. What happens in a ton of Monster Hunter games is that there's a major disconnect between the single player and multiplayer aspects of the game. All the NPCs you've been talking to, all the cool parts of the village, that's all single player locked. All the hanging out with your friends is in a separate box where it's just you and the other players and maybe one or two major NPCs. It feels like two separate experiences. In Elgato, it's all seamless. You, your friends, the story, the NPCs, the utilities, the vendors, you're all together the whole time in one seamless instant. It all feels cohesive, like it's one experience. The whole of Sunbreak takes place together. Does that make sense? Yes. 
in Kimura, other players can be in your village, and the hub is separated from the village from a blink's worth of a loading screen. But there's still two separate quest lists and separated areas meant for multiplayer and single player, just with some overlap this time. Here, it's all one thing. And that's such a small detail, but it changed my appreciation and fun with Elgato. It feels like it all happens together. You don't beat the single player and then go play online. There's no segregation between the two. It might sound stupid to harp on this point, but this choice to make Elgato have no loading screens made it feel as though everything you do in Sunbreak was one singular experience. You don't miss out on the charm of the characters when you're playing with your friends. You don't miss out on the multiplayer hunting experience while you're going through the story. It helps even more that Rise got rid of that dumbass cutscene requirement where everyone has to see it independently that World has. Just put multiple hunters in the same cutscene or just the host or just your hunter, what, whatever. There's easier ways to fix that. Anyway, it's a lot of fun to be able to play Sunbreak Story and go through its whole experience with my friends. You don't have to compromise on any aspect of Elgato at any time. Elgato is also super easy to navigate. Everything is within a few feet of each other. No need to go 300 feet in another direction to go trade. Everything is super easy to access and your pre-hunt prep work is incredibly convenient to complete. Everything is all set in about five minutes in between hunts. If Elgato has any downsize, it's that I still do very much enjoy the style of kind of a mead hall for a gathering hub. I love a proper hall in the heart of a major city, something like that. And Elgato has that lack of a convening place for warriors to gather and swap stories in between battles. Additionally, it also lacks any mini games or cool features to play around with. I know I just talked about loving the cohesiveness of Elgato, and now I'm talking about wanting an enclosed gathering hub. Honestly, I'm fine with either. I'm just marking what I think Elgato does really well, but, and I, who knows, maybe you could do something where you have a nice open village and it leads up to a gathering hall that doesn't really have a loading screen or something. I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing ideas. I like what both of these things do. Aesthetically, Elgato looks pretty sick. It's both a seaside port overlook and an in-progress European castle-style military outpost. And I'm a sucker for anything built on the sea so I'm immediately a fan of the aesthetic. And I love the in-progress, partially complete feel to the place. One tower is done, the other isn't, there's a few massive cranes spattered about, and there are several rail car tracks used to ferry parts and supplies and felines from one part of the outpost to the other. The place feels well-engineered, but still kind of roughshod. Elgato is built on top of a little strip of land between the ocean and a huge pit on the side of a mountain, which I think was created by either Malzino or Guy's Magor, or both fighting, I, I don't quite remember, but the pit is an object of investigation for the Knights of Elgato, and said pit is being filled up with water pouring in from the ocean that you can watch. If you look in between the slats in Elgato's wooden floor, you can even see the water moving underneath the outpost, spilling out from the ocean, going underneath your feet, and then going down into the pit, which is a really cool little detail. Stuff like this makes Elgato feel impressive, that such a sturdy military base could be constructed on such uncertain terrain. Rain. The color is a lot simpler than Kimura, predominantly a lighter brown for the wood planks, cobblestone gray for the masonry, and a teal blue for the roofs and the buildings, all of which look really nice with the seaside view. I think the color choice here is great. I love how messy and partially completed the place looks while still being impressive and suitably regal for the European medieval aesthetic of Sunbreak. Now, what I really want to see is a game starring this kingdom they talked about through all of Sunbreak, but never showed us. I think that'd be pretty sick. Rise and Sunbreak knocked the these places out of the park. Brilliantly crafted, aesthetically pleasing, and capable of creating immersion and cohesive experiences that none of their predecessors were able to achieve. There is absolutely some improvements that could be made here, and there are other hubs and villages that do some things better, but I think Kimura and Elgato set very high standards for what Monster Hunter hubs and villages can be. If you're a fan of this channel, I think it should be pretty obvious to you that I love Monster Hunter music. Music in general, honestly. Though, not as versed in the terminology as I'd like to be and not as able to communicate my thoughts on a piece as well as I'd like, still love talking about it. I'm not going to go over every single individual piece of music in Rise at Sunbreak because that would take entirely too long and uh, this part of the script is long enough as it is, but I think I want to cover the music in this game in a couple easy chunks and just let the music do the talking for itself in a few places. Uh, let's start with village themes. There's a few different musical pieces for the different areas around town and this 
cluster of tracks are absolutely soaked in the Japanese aesthetic of Rise. There's an abundance of traditional Japanese instrumentation in pretty much every track we have here, as well as some excellent accompanying vocal performances in several of them. For the main town theme, Komura Song of Purification, Hunter's Hub theme, Brave Hunters, and Rise's menu themes, the songs are being sung by the characters Hinoa and Minoto, your two quest maidens, though it's not their voice actresses singing, it's still the, like, supposed to be the characters themselves. And I gotta say, love the performances here, and the music built around them. Now, of course, I am a big, strong, tough, cool guy, and I'm not supposed to like very pretty and elegant music like this. Uh, to be honest, when this game was being marketed, I distinctly remember thinking, do they have to show these women singing for like 40 seconds in every trailer? But I grew to really adore these pieces. The sense of home and peace and tranquility they came to represent. They make Kimura feel safe, cultured, warm, tranquil, and relaxing. You don't mind simply sitting back and resting for a good long while and allowing the music to just kind of wash over you and help you unwind. And this isn't all Kimura has to offer, either. The training arena theme, The Secret of Kimura, is quiet, mysterious, and ancient. It feels not exactly intense, but disciplined. It's this sequestered away piece of the town, far away from most of the civilians where hunters go to train. I usually put on something much more intense here, thanks to the ability to swap background music around, but I kind of like the focused and mighty yet understated feel that this piece has. Thinking of Strange Lands, which is the Argosy theme, Best Buddies, which is the Buddy Plaza theme, and the Meocenary theme are all pretty fun little tracks too. And I'm willing to bet we've breezed past these ones a million times. These vendors don't need their own musical pieces, and they certainly didn't need to be as good as they are, but they help flesh out the personality of the different people who live here and add just that extra little level of eccentricity and liveliness to Kimura as a whole. And then there's the Dango song. It's cute. Fast forwarding to Sunbreak, let's talk about Elgato's theme while we're about village music right now. Elgato only really has the one theme due to it being a much more seamless area than Kimura. Makes it so there's less to talk about, but what we do have here is no less great. It's something that's just kind of immediately nostalgic to me. It just kind of triggers whatever chemical that is in the brain.
it's very relaxed, casual, laid back, almost inviting you to just take it easy and watch the sea. The accordion, the acoustic guitar, the soft horns and strings and a little bit of percussion all blend excellently and work to lull one into this sense of security and safety. Honestly, if I had any complaints, it's almost that it's too lax considering the context for Elgato being built. I love it as a seaside track specifically. I can vividly imagine that smell of the ocean and that light breeze and the sound of rolling waves when I listen to it. This is a piece I have on in the background when I work pretty often. Now let's talk about monster themes. I want to talk about remixes first and then original music for this game. Rise's monster theme remixes are a mixed bag. And I don't mean that in a it's actually negative, but I'm saying mixed bag to cushion the blow type of way. It's flat out mixed. I would say in general, a lot of the remixes have some beauty and mystique added to them in exchange for some sharpness, impact and feeling of size. A lot of Rise's remixes brought in vocals and tried to create this kind of sense of mysticism and perhaps, I guess, maybe whimsy in a few places. And though this is a good idea with certain themes and in certain sections of certain themes, a recurring issue I have with the remixes in Rise and a little bit in Sunbreak is that a lot of the pieces lack the heft, strength, impact, sharpness, bite, and danger that I personally prefer. I think there's some cool ideas, some fun experimentation, and some great extra bits here and there to reinvigorate some of these classics, but the trade-off is the music feels a little softer and a little fatter, I would say, and lacks some of that kick that you can kind of just feel in your blood with those original versions of some of these pieces. The best example I can think of is Nagakuga's theme. The lull in his music has never felt better. The quiet instruments and harmonious vocals create this very mystic, peaceful, misty forest atmosphere that's super easy to just get sucked into, creates this false sense of security. But on the crescendo, the pounce of the Nagakuga, the song just doesn't come up harsh enough and can't hit with the right impact. Zhang is another one that suffers from this issue. The more fantastical and whimsical feel of his theme here compared to, say, Iceborne or Generations incarnations just doesn't really fit for what is supposed to be such a violent and aggressive creature.
almost felt the same way about Tigrex's theme, but they managed to bring the power towards the back half of his music. of these themes, though still not as sharp as their originals, got some benefits from the added vocals. The fantastical atmosphere added to Mizutsune's theme is perfectly suited for him specifically. Geese's theme has a nice extra layer of dread and fear added to his music due to the inclusion of vocals. And Tiostra almost gets kind of this Arabian King type of vibe to his music. Of monsters like Zenogre, Kushalador, uh, Chameleos, and Seregios got some cool new sections added to their music, which I liked in pretty much every case I just listed. Some extra flares of personality that reinvigorate these pieces. Zenogre gets this massive shot of testosterone in his. Shala Diora gets this injection of kind of a wintry feeling to it. Camellios gets this awesome section that really emphasizes his cunning and mischief mixed with his might as an elder dragon. And so Regios gets kind of this neat little melancholy fallen action that rockets back up into his main theme. A few of the pieces, like Espinas and Volstrax, have their themes composed pretty much the same, but as I said, lose some of the oomph from the different style of the game, and don't benefit as much from music experimentation as a few of the other themes do. And I think Velkana and Amatsu didn't even get remixes at all.
collection of other themes have some elements throughout that change the whole feel of the track. Gormagala's theme feels a little less frenzied and violent and a bit more controlled, oppressive, and lordly. Astolos has this kind of electrical distortion effect on some of the impacts in his music that feeds into his overflowing lightning abilities. There's a lot of what I regard to be pretty good ideas in here, and very few pieces that I think are a harsh downgrade from the original. I like how they added bits and pieces here and tried to inject new personality or add flavor to what's already there, but there's a wide margin of good and not so good ideas shuffled in together, compounded with a general sound design that usually does not strike quite as hard as some of the music that came before. Now for the original music tracks for the original monsters to this game, and out the gate, love all of them. Though that may be partially due to the fact that they don't have previous versions to be compared to like the remixes. However, I do think that they are all fantastic by their own merits, and considering they were composed for Rise and Sunbreak, they may simply be more fitting for that game's style. But at the same time, I do think that these tracks generally pack some of the kick that I really look for in Monster Hunter themes. But that's just me rambling to myself, all these tracks bang, let's get into them. Magnum Apollo's theme is gold. I think it's perfectly fitting for him specifically. It's confident, fantastical, barbaric, bold, violent, haunting, and triumphant. Here's where I think the more mythical tone of some of Rise's music really works. Magnum Molo is not a particularly ecologically grounded animal. Uh, he's a samurai tiger who fights battles with the quote-unquote souls of his victims, and he has extendable bone swords on his arms. Having a piece that feels like you're fighting a dark spirit and not so much a typical animalistic wyvern really fits for Magnum Molo. There's a power and wrath behind it that stays nice and tense and never really lets go of said tension.
The Storm Serpents have some of the best themes in all of Monster Hunter, just hands down. As a three-part story documented over three songs, each just as brilliant as the last, this medley is legitimately tough to beat. And they work Hinoa and Minoto back into the musical soundtrack of Rise. The brilliance here is that unlike a lot of the other music pieces listed here, the vocals aren't just an instrument. They are Ibushi and Narwa singing through the two Wyverians. Their grief, anger, rage, longing, and revenge expressed through the music, communicating the immense intellect and powerful minds these animals possess. Hinoa for Ibushi, Minoto for Narwa, and the two voices combined for the all-mother Narwa. Ibushi's is the most sad. The lonesomeness and searching can be heard throughout the entire track, and there is a fair amount of might wielded behind the wind serpent. This is the battle theme of a desperate yet magnificent creature who resents you for being in his way. Narwa's theme is majestic, powerful, graceful, commanding, and is driven by a marching percussion. It feels more aggressive than Ibushi's, but doesn't ever lose the feeling of ethereal godliness that these two possess. The drums and horns roll like thunder, building and building to a lofty and heavenly melody that strikes with authority. Mother Narwa's theme is goosebump inducing, and I do not say that with any exaggeration. Every single time I listen to it, it sends a chill through my body. Every singular emotion felt by Nabushi and Narwa is felt here. Connection, the finding of one another, loss, grief, wrath, revenge, mercilessness, godliness, intelligence, desperation, and tragedy. These musical themes have Japanese versions with lyrics that are translated as well as they can be because this isn't a one-to-one -one language, and I found a few interpretations of the themes here and there, though I still very much believe that the artistic intention is that the two dragons do sing through the Wyvarian twins, the lyrics of Narwa and Ibushi's themes seem to very much be more about them than from them. All Mother's theme, however, seems to be very much written from her perspective, and I found two translations and two versions of the chorus read as such. Together, our kin will judge this world of sorrow. We will become the bearers of paradise. Now come forth. And alternatively, all together with our descendants, we'll eradicate this deplorable world, for our paradise is our family. Now, hastily. This family, their offspring, they're everything to these two. And they fail.
This track reminds us that slaying the All Mother is survival for us and a bitter sweet victory at the very best. And next we have Malzino. His theme is regal, dignified, cunning, grandiose, and sinister. The once stalwart and strong protector, an emaciated, sleek, and lithe lord of dread and blood. The ramp up foretells doom and death. Heavy percussion, a dire chorus, horns blaring alarm, and a looming organ build tension until the track explodes into a fanfare of spectacular despair. The track takes his vampire dragon concept and screams it from the depths of hell. Perfectly crafted track for one of the all-time great monsters. And as someone who loves the sound of an organ, I can't help but love this track. Then there's f Geismagorm. Skyward grace and elegance cast away for something ugly, foul and disastrous beneath the surface of the earth. You can hear the ground shaking in the first moments of the track. Once again, a perfect summation of personality and characterization in a piece of music. Guys Magorm's music is dripping with calamity and menace. The instruments chosen aren't too dissimilar from Malzino's, but here the organ thunders, the horns screech, the strings crawl, and the chorus screams. Guys Magorm's music tells you that it is a threat to the planet. There's no sympathy or tragedy here, only fear. Such a fantastic fantastic contrast between this and the Storm Serpents. The maps in Rise have a mixed to positive assortment of themes. Shrine Ruins has a pretty lax piece of music, all things considered. It matches the tranquil, ancient, and storied atmosphere of the map, but it's not the most intense battle track out there. It's fitting for some low-stakes battles, sure, but it's almost a little too playful for some of the bigger threats on the map. The Frost Isles theme also has a bit of a playful atmosphere, but this feels a little bit more adventurous, a little bit more lively, more looking to explore. And a few quieted sections give the map a layer of intrigue, mystery, and suspense, communicating that there's some danger beneath the gorgeous snow. I think the Flooded Forest theme got a downgrade, unfortunately. It's fine, but the heavy, dark, foreboding, and sinister tones of the original map are dialed down substantially for a tone that matches the lighter and I'd say more adventurous feel that Rise has in general. The forest still maintains its mystery, but loses a bit of its threat.
the Sandy Plains though, and this is just another chance for me to talk about how much I love this map, they abandoned a remix entirely and went with a gorgeous brand new theme. It matches the grand, fun, and vast tone of a lot of the maps, but really doubles down on it more than most of them. It's extremely heroic and triumphant. It features an exceptional female vocalist and has this bounding high-speed rhythm when it crescendos that gets stuck in your head long after hearing it. Lava Caverns has great music for effectively the same reason as Sandy Plains. It's got the heftiest percussion out of the map battle tracks, making the start of the piece feel a bit more oppressive and harsh. Listening to it, I get this feeling of not being a novice any longer, being a powerful fighter in my own right. And whether the intentional or unintentional, I feel like this track being on the main game's final map grants this feeling of progression and empowerment. The Jungle has a pretty faithful remix of its original theme. The instrumentation choice here is a little bit more of a traditional orchestra and leaves behind some of the more tribal aspects of the original score. It loses some of the first version's more dark and haunting atmosphere for a few new sections that match some of Rise's more bright and heroic tracks that we heard earlier on. Kind of similar to what happened with the Flooded Forest theme, but I think it's much less of a downgrade here personally. The Citadel's theme is dark and ominous, not too bombastic for the most part. It feels like a particularly dour, overgrown, and challenging part of the world. However, as is usual with Rise, there is a triumphant blaring of horns to signal the power of the hunter, but much more somber and reserved than the wild exuberance of, say, the Lava Caverns or Sandy Plains. It's an effective track for this map. And as for the two single arena maps, the Infernal Spring possesses an exceptional theme that's among the most dark and foreboding arena themes I think I've ever heard. It's a fittingly doom-infused theme, considering some of the more difficult quests in the game that can be done here. It has a forbidden air to it, a true sense that you are unwelcome and will be disposed of. It feels borderline Souls-esque in a few places.
and the Forlorn Arena has a really good remix of its classic tower theme, staying pretty faithful to the original and still maintaining the ancestral mystique and archaic beauty of the area. Rampage themes, I gotta tell ya, these are full on iconic already. There's a reason this video's trailer used the Rampage theme. The initial theme has a sound of heavy, militaristic percussion to start, a feeling of preparation bracing against the uncoming onslaught. It's an excellent build up to the storm gradually stockpiling tension until the Rampage theme explodes into the clashing of battle. The music here feels like a great, honorable, duty-bound duel. It's a war theme, specifically a defensive war theme. One that says that this is our home, and it cannot be allowed to fall. This changes when the Apex monsters arrive. Remember when I talked about missing strength and impact and blood pumping danger and sharp cutting notes and big and drums and some of the monster themes in Rise? Well, good news, I found it. <laughs> It's a shame this theme is locked to Apex Battles in the Rampage because this is another Rise track that ranks high up on the list of my favorite in the entire series. I consider the Rampage theme an honorary main theme for Rise. I think it's as closely associated with this game as its rendition of Proof of a Hero. As far as the two Proof of a Hero renditions, Rises is superb. The best word I can associate with it is gallivanting. The rhythm here inspires this feeling of forward movement and grand things ahead, a need to soldier forth into a world that is both beautiful and dangerous. The Sunbreak incarnation stews more in the dark undertones of the expansion and feels a bit more ominous than just about any other rendition of the theme. Whereas Rise's proof of a hero feels like an adventure, Sunbreak's feels like a triumph, a light in the dark.
All right. We've talked about music for a long while now, and believe me, this is the very heavily trimmed down version of the music portion of the script. Lastly, I want to cover the stories of Rise and Sunbreak. You might be thinking, Connor, Monster Hunter never has amazing stories. You really don't have to go that in depth into the narratives here. The stories of these games are always pure function, really, with minimal substance to serve as context for the gameplay. And my response to that is, well, why can't they be good? And who says there isn't good already there to find? And if these stories aren't fantastic, why not demand better? And here's the thing, one of these stories is actually kind of good, so why not celebrate that? Let's take a look at what these games have to offer. So, Monster Hunter Rise's story, it's kind of whatever, until the ending, and kind of the Amatsu update, let me explain. The entire crux of Rise's story is the Rampage. What the Rampage is, how it affects our characters, what is its cause, and how is it stopped? Well, the Rampage is an onslaught of violent and destructive monsters destroying ecosystems, which is a direct threat to the people of Kimura, who have lost many people and parts of this village in past Rampages. And for reasons past and present, they are determined to stop it. A very similar event occurred 50 years ago, doing horrific damage and impacting some of the characters we meet in the game's story. The Rampage is caused by two mysterious Elder Dragons, and a very powerful monster is caught up in the middle of these events. This powerful monster has history with some of the involved characters and is a rival in the middle sections of the story. And for a couple of reasons, the story doesn't hit too hard. One of the big problems is you, the main character. Now, it might throw some people a little bit off to have their character talking in a game like this, but I'm gonna be honest, I kinda hate this trend. Your character is supposed to be a blank slate that you project on, and thus has minimal expressions, and yet is still the focal rallying point around which this secondary cast puts all their faith in and leans on and roots for. Can we stop? doing this, pay a voice actor, please. I can relate with, empathize with, and impress upon characters that talk. I know the guy on the screen isn't me, because in these situations, I would be talking. I don't care if my custom character has the same exact personality as everybody else's. I really don't. When games do this, the secondary cast has to do so much more legwork to make the story compelling because the central character doesn't do anything. And at times where these side characters talk about how great you are or how impactful you are in their lives, I don't believe them because my guy doesn't talk or do anything. This is kind of a general video game issue at large, but it, it hurts this game too. At least this bothers me, maybe this doesn't bother you. Another issue is the stakes of the situation. An oncoming tide of rampaging monsters known to be capable of wiping out a town because they've done so before is taken seriously, but I, I don't know, not that seriously. Though I will say when Narwa is introduced, the hunt for her is given a little bit more gravitas and tension than the other dangers in the game. <laughs> Considering she's the key why Ibushi is causing the rampages. 
throughout, the characters have a pretty upbeat and we can do it attitude throughout, which is okay, but I think it kind of undersells the danger of the rampage. No one gets hurt during the rampage. The village doesn't get damaged. Oh man, that's its own issue. Where are we fighting? The final gate for these missions is not Kimura's gate. I did some looking. I don't think you can see Kimura from the rampage fortress and you can't see the rampage fortress from Kimura. And I guess it's not the worst tactical idea to build the fortress away from Kimura. Kimura. It seems to be built in like a choke point in these mountains like a while away. But what happens if that fortress falls? Is there a bunch of traps in the woods? You could probably afford to build another backup fortress in the woods, considering Kimura is at the end of just this narrow little peninsula, which shouldn't be too difficult to defend from an entirely ground-based attack, and honestly, I think these are important questions and things to point out. I think not being able to see the village I'm defending during the village defense mission alongside all the other villagers does cause at least a little bit of a disconnect. There have been plenty of other big battles in Monster Hunter where you don't see the places you're supposed to protect, but the rampage feels so interconnected to Kimura that it feels odd that the fight seems so far away away from it. And knowing that the fight is so distant from our home, again, reduces some of the tension, because if that last gate falls, the monsters aren't spilling out into Kimura, they're running another two or so miles towards a little peninsula towards a village that is water surrounding it, and it has boats so the people could just get away. You know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily feel like if that last gate goes down, that's it, we're done. Because again, there's like like two miles or something between the mountains and the village. The people have time. Now, the big reason I don't think this story is too strong is because it's almost too focused on the rampage. And yeah, it should be very focused on that. That's the plot. But Rise's narrative is kind of all plots until the end, but we're not there yet. The weakness here is the characters. I don't hate these characters, but for the most part, they're fairly static and fairly one note. Now, I will admit it's been a while since I played this story, so there may be some decent dialogue from the characters that I've missed out on about them, and if I have, please correct me about it. But for the life of me, I don't remember any instance of the events of the Rampage really changing any of the characters, nor revealing too much about them, other than very typical tenacity, sense of community, and fighting spirit in the face of danger. Uh, these are nice traits to have, they're not unlikable people, but they don't quite hook me. Let's give kind of a big example. There are a couple of instances where the two Wyverian twins, Hinoa and Minoto, telepathically resonate with Narwa and Ibushi. That's an odd plot point in of itself, but we'll talk about that later. By some means that aren't particularly well explained through Hinoa and Minoto's strong connection as twins and or their nature as Wyverians, they're able to pick up on the emotions, feelings, and animalistic thoughts of Narwa and Ibushi, and this sparks appropriate base-level concern from the characters, but is treated more as a plot development than anything. And the twins don't really change all that much from the experience. I'd like to learn more about you know, how they feel about the situation. Uh, again, there's enough. There's a little bit of lip service of it being an odd sensation, being weird that this is an occurrence that's going on. There's no real cutscene that kind of goes over what impact being within the minds of these animals are. There's no breakdown of uncovering how intelligent these animals are, that they seem to have fairly complex thoughts to them through this resonance. There's the appropriate surface level reactions, and that's why these characters are fine, they're likable, but there's not a lot of 
exploration. There's not a lot of delving. There's not a ton of going into the meat and potatoes and the finer details of how these characters feel about the Rampage, about the Rampage Apex monsters, about the Magnamalo, about the Twin Serpents. But I think the resonance is the biggest thing to really kind of hammer on on this point that I'm trying to make is this directly involves two characters. This directly gets in the head of two of the characters, and the attention given is just on the surface, and there's not a lot of exploration given into it. That, I think, is something that I think would have really helped Rise, is just getting kind of more into the meat of what do these things, these occurrences, these dragons, these monsters, these paranormal events, what do they mean to the people who are affecting them? You bump that forward and I think Rise has a much better story. It's a small change, but it goes from Monster Hunter Rise having a plot to Monster Hunter Rise having a story, you know what I mean? And I, like I've been talking about, I do think it eventually gets a story, but that is in the final act. You could have much more earlier on in the development really kind of got into the mindsets of these characters. And I think the resonance is the thing I want to harp on the most because I think that is the thing that is the most deep in with the characters of this game. So that's why I'm harping on this point specifically. Throughout the story, this happens a lot. Major plot points will happen, things look kind of bad, everyone rallies around us, we the hunter pulls through, and the other characters are content to help from the sidelines or are implied to be helping, but rarely get to participate in the actual hunts alongside us. And most everyone is pretty much the exact same going into the conflict as they are coming out, with a few small tidbits of their character revealed here and there. Though I do think Minoto is my favorite character in the cast of Rise. She's incredibly protective of her twin sister and has a generally very calm and serene personality. However, she's also a bit clumsy and racked with self-doubt, creating this crossroad where she wants to be a protector, but has doubts that she's good enough to fulfill that role. And that's pretty interesting. A few other characters that have potential to be pretty cool. Utsushi is your mentor and is kind of an earned casual confidence because he's a pretty damn proficient warrior and a skilled tracker who does a lot of the village's scouting. I think think he would have benefited a lot if we got to flush out his relationship with us and we got to go scouting with him. In fact, his inclusion in the Amatsu update, which gives us exactly this experience with him, really bumps him up in how much I like him. Hammond is another character who really could have had a good moment. When scorned Magnamalo is given an urgent quest in Sunbreak, it is implied through dialogue that this could be the specific Magnamalo that attacked Komura 50 years ago, was maimed by Fugen and Hammond, and racked up a pretty catastrophic body count. We learn from dialogue that Hammond is angered when scorned arrives, but it's only lip service and isn't really explored. The biggest victim here is Magnamalo himself. His story presence is the bare minimum and he's supposed to be the flagship. Magnamalo is supposed to be this opportunistic predator with a bit of a sinister edge to him. He predates upon the rampage, killing and eating the participating monsters and human alike in order to fuel himself. 50 years ago, one was partially responsible for ravaging Kimura Village. It's known that he isn't the cause of the rampage, but he is this one entity within it who is completely unafraid of this circumstance and uses it wholly to his own ambition. This is a super cool motivation for an antagonist in these games. A lot of the time, a flagship monster is often very closely related to the doings of the big bad final boss, is blamed for, or is victim to the big bad's actions, and sometimes it has no relation at all. Magnamalo seems to be the only monster, Magnamalo seems to be the only monster that is completely unafraid of the end bosses. Even the rampage apexes, these monsters who are scarred, powerful survivors of Ibushi's storms, dominate the ramp pages and have a battle theme that sounds like oncoming death are still running in fear from Ibushi, but Magnamalo isn't. He thrives in this chaos the rampage creates and should be this terrifying calm in the middle of a storm, the threat within the threat, the much more personal enemy. And he gets nothing. Magnamalo pops up in one cutscene.
showing off this cool Arzros he caught after a wave of the rampage has already ended. Scare some of the characters, a little exposition is given about him. その群れを食らう化け物だ。食べるんだ。50年前、佐藤は百獣役を and then you go track him down in the middle of the woods where no one won't see a hand, nothing. Whack him and go about on your merry way. And then when you fight All Mother Narwa, a different one shows up and helps you fight her, which is neat, but like, he is so. So wasted in this game. The one who shows up during the rampage isn't even the same Magnamalo that fights the All Mother with you. Dude goes, hey, I found this cool bear, and that is a crime punishable by death. The demon within the rampage couldn't even be encountered within the rampage until post-launch content. There is a solid, solid chance that the story of this game was heavily hurt by COVID, and some things were cut out of launch of the game and shuffled and cycled around. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but I don't think that's an excuse excuse, but it is context. I think Magnamalo got screwed completely, whether his potential simply wasn't recognized or because there was content that had to be cut and deadlines that had to be met. One way or the other, the end product of Rise failed its flagship. I think a good flagship and enemy in Magnamalo could have done a lot of good for Rise's narrative, because even though my issues with the characters and story probably would have been maintained, I don't expect good characters in a Monster Hunter game as much as I expect a good main antagonist. Alternatively, Narwa and Ibushi provide one of Monster Hunter's most interesting finales. I wanted to hold this for this section and not delve into them too deeply in the music of the monster sections, but I think there's an ultimately fairly sad story here. Narwa and Ibushi are two creatures ultimately too powerful and too uncaring of the world beneath them for their own good. When the mating season begins, Ibushi will go searching for where a Narwa has made her nest, and the rampage is caused simply by the windstorms he kicks up in search for her. <laughs> In his desperation, he rips the land asunder, and the massive thunder and windstorm created by the mating ritual when they're together makes the rampage even worse. Kimura dwells within the territory that these two storm serpents carved, and for Kimura to survive, the serpents must die. And yeah, you can make horny simp jokes about Ibushi, and yeah, sure, that, that's funny, but I think the story of Narwa and Ibushi is worth allowing some reverence to. It is the music that tells their story and grants them a voice. As I spoke about earlier, Narwa and Ibushi's songs are sung by Hinoa and Minoto's vocalists, as the two can resonate with the dragons, or uh, vice versa, it's still not entirely clear how that mechanic works. They can understand Narwa and Ibushi's thoughts, and interpretation of the music is that these songs are Narwa and Ibushi singing through Hinoa and Minoto, and the tone of the music absolutely backs that up. I recommend you check out Davi Vosk's three-parter about the music, as myself delving into them would be repeating a lot of what he says in his videos, but you can just kind of feel it. The desperation, the madness, the anger, and the violence in Ibushi's theme, followed by the authority, care, maturity, and solemnity in Narwa's theme. But it's the all-mother theme that tells you how these two feel about each other. There was some discourse going around when this game came out, and when all-mother released, that she treats Ibushi as a female praying mantis does to a mate after procreation, eating him after the work is done. But that's not what is communicated here. Both Narwa and Ibushi have been tested by you once in combat, before the final encounter each. They're both battered, bruised, and weakened. Ibushi can only put up a fight for a minute or two. And when he gets sent crashing down into the nest, there's a pause. A moment between the two, kind of this hesitation. They ignore you completely. Ibushi is likely fatally wounded at this point, and the body language and music tells us he isn't callously consumed. 
Sacrifices himself. The music is heartbroken as he dies, with the percussion then booming in as he falls, and the All Mother is created, signaling resolve and fury backed by incredible pain. Narwa is ripped apart in doing this, the melodies of both themes combining as Ibushi's essence grants Narwa tremendous power, and two parents fight in one body to save their brood. But they can't win. Narwa has to lose too. Narwa and Ibushi aren't necessarily victims. Much of the resonance we hear between them speaks of ripping the world asunder and destroying anything that isn't the two of them. What sapiency they have absolutely paints them as villainous. We're not entirely sure exactly how smart they are, but often it is implied that Elder Dragons can be intelligent as people. These two did need to die. But there is an enormously human-like connection between the two, a genuine emotion shared, something that goes beyond a breeding instinct, maybe love. And because they have nothing but disdain for all else, they're put down. And the story of Rise ends in victory, grand victory, but knowing these two animals, it is bittersweet. Rise's story has a lot of problems, but this story within the story I think is beautiful. Masterfully told through music and combat and visuals and animation. Does Narwa and Ibushi's tale make for an entire package that is exemplary? No. They don't retroactively fix the rest of Rise's issues, but they are why I think Rise's story will persist in our memory. One last thing I want to cover before we move on is the Amatsu update, as this is absolutely absolutely a Rise story, and I'm gonna keep saying this. I still think Amatsu was planned for base game Rise and got shuffled back due to COVID. Amatsu's chapter is an example of a good story told kinda weird. There's a minor subplot tucked away in the back of Rise, hidden in chatter here and there. That being that the young girl Yamogi, who serves Dango, is the orphaned princess of a destroyed kingdom, and the shop owner Kagoro is the man who saved her, brought her to Kimura, taught her through her young life, and a friend to her family who all died when their kingdom fell, entrusted with Yomogi's life by her mother before she died. The bringer of this tragedy was Amatsu, and when Amatsu rears its head, Kagoro sees an opportunity to avenge everything he lost. The only issue I have with this section is how it's told in game. Throughout Rise, Yomogi and Kagoro's identities are said to be mysterious. We get little bits and pieces drip-fed about the fact that they aren't born in Komura, and that only a select few people know who they truly are. Due to the fact that Amatsu was added while Sunbreak and its story and Elgato was running, we started to get bits of their backstories fed to us via tweets from the official Monster Hunter account. We learn the tragedy of their backstory, and even read a letter that Kagoro wrote to Yomogi to explain everything, but he chose to hide it, unsure of the right time to give it to her. It's good stuff. It's tragic, very bittersweet, and yet heartwarming, knowing that Kagero never left her side and always watched from a distance, letting her be happy and unburdened with the truth. So we got all this information via external sources, originally. And then, when Amatsu arrives in the game, all this information is then regurgitated in an unceremonious exposition dump with no voice acting, no build-up, no nothing. They just explain Kagero's whole character, and I'm telling you, this probably wasn't how they planned to do this. They started planting these seeds in the beginning of Rise. They dropped the Infernal Springs out of nowhere post-launch, but because Amatsu had to be pushed back, they didn't build up his story or Kagero and Yomogi's in-game. They built it up online, 
fine because the game was telling a different story by the time they could get around to doing this update. And the impact of this narrative takes a hit because the context though compelling context, is delivered to the player in a way that feels flat. So that's my only complaint. It's more of a structure thing than the actual meat. As for the events of the updates, Kagura leaves Kimura the moment he hears about Amatsu and leaves the letter to Yamogi because he's going out there to die. He considers himself a dead man on borrowed time anyway, given to him by his friends who were massacred so that he could save Yamogi. He fulfilled that task, and now what lays before him is a chance to exact his revenge or join everybody he knew and loved in the afterlife. ここ仕事<笑> But he still has somebody, doesn't he? Yamoki begs him to not throw his life away. She still needs him. And as Utsushi and ourselves arrive, Amatsu turns and fires a shot. Kagero lets out every frustration in a moment of catharsis, makes his choice, and preserves both his and Yamogi's life, conceding the task to the more experienced hunters and taking Yamogi home. Amatsu is very evocative of the Storm Serpents, a massive, graceful, storm-calling leviathan of the skies capable of ungodly destruction, commanding wind, thunder, and water, his power is beyond that of either of the Storm Serpents individually by a wide margin. Perhaps Amatsu too has a story, a purpose, an instinct, an aspect of humanity, but there is no family, no mate, no song of tragedy, no grand lament, nothing to protect, and what we know of Amatsu in other chunks of lore does not paint him as benevolent in any way, shape, or form. Amatsu have acted as displacers, destroyers, and killers. The battle is us and Utsushi, master and apprentice, the two best Komura has to offer against a dragon who falls just short of the highest echelons of power in the franchise. And remember how I talked about how Utsushi could be a really cool character due to his relationship with us, his chill personality, and his responsibilities within the village? Well, we physically get to see all of that as he disappears off a few minutes, comes back relaxed as can be, and trailed by an apex Zenogre. <laughs> If you're a nerd for this like me, you know that Zenogarth 
and hate Amatsu, as the two have overlapped in territory before, with Amatsu displacing their populations, and it's just another layer of goodness. The best turf war in Monster Hunter plays out, and then you and your teacher wyvern ride the unrideable Rampage Apex together as one against the Storm Dragon, battling until he finally drops. That is some good sh**. Again, there's a structural issue in the exposition part of the narrative delivery, but the contrast between the previous big bads, the attention to lore, the excellent character moments in this update, the good absolutely outweighs the bad, and does a lot of what I think Rise struggle with. Okay, so what about Sunbreak then? So Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak story. It's honestly pretty good. Let me explain. The entire crux of Sunbreak's story is the affliction. What the affliction is, how it affects our characters. What is its cause, how is it stopped? Well, the affliction is an onslaught of violent and destructive monsters, destroying ecosystems, which is a direct threat to the people of a yet-to-be-named kingdom. Yet-to-be-named outside of the game. I'm sure they have a name for it in-game, but they don't palace, who have lost many people and elements of this kingdom in past affliction outbreaks, and for reasons past and present, they are determined to stop it. A very similar event occurred 50 years ago, doing horrific damage and impacting some of the characters we meet in the game's story. The affliction is caused by a mysterious elder dragon, and a powerful monster is caught up in the middle of these events. This powerful monster has history with some of the involved characters, and is a rival in the middle sections of the story, and for a couple of reasons, this story comes corrects a lot of Rise's issues. The biggest improvement here by a wide margin are the characters. Now, these aren't the most fascinating characters ever written. Some of the dialogue is kind of hokey and feels like a parody of European knights and people of that time period more than actual words that real people would speak sometimes. And you're still playing a plank of wood. I don't want to oversell how good this story is, but it is good, and I think it needs to be talked about why it's good. Sunbreak's characters have more to them, flat out. More growth, more dimension, and very importantly, more to do. And remember the more to do part, because I think that's the biggest thing that they have going here. I talked about this with the follower section of this video, but the NPCs have the ability to go out and hunt with you in this game. Now, most of this is in subquests that aren't necessarily linked to the main campaign, and I'll talk about some of those in a bit. But in the main storyline, Dame Fiorain gets to hunt by your side for several of the major quests in Sunbreak. And because you're a plank of wood, reactions to the going on in the story, human connectivity, and interpretation of the situation at hand comes from Fia Rain. You get a grip on her personality, what she thinks about her homeland and hunting, about the mounting threat, about you as an outsider here to help. Having her around helps to contextualize the hunts and helps to strengthen their meaning. And her hunting with you allows her to have more of a character, and as I'll discuss as we go, a legitimate arc. She begins the story as a staunch and unwavering patriot to her homeland, one who is eager to slay any threat to the kingdom she loves. This isn't a bad quality in of itself, but she is committed to facing threats to the point of rashness, impulsivity, and potential self-harm, a quality which she is chastised for by Admiral Gallius. And if you go into the follower subquest, you get to learn extra tidbits of her character and those of some of the other characters. You can learn about the older sister role she plays with the other knights, Luchica and Jay, and how she tries to get them to balance their eccentric personalities with their duties as hunters. You can learn more about the fact that Luchica's very professional and straightforward attitude falls away in the heat of battle, and how all the characters have a deep respect for their mentor, Master Arlo, and leader, Admiral Gallius. And even some of Kimura's characters, who did not get too much development in their own part of the game, get a little bit of extra layers to them. Rondine and Fia Rain are shown to have a little strain in their relationship as sisters. Utsushi encourages the hunting abilities of the other people he hunts with. Elder Fugen's upbeat and fiery personality gets to shine through a little more. These aren't components of the main story, but this chunk of subquests gets to add these extra layers to the characters that flush them out and give them relationships with one another, and opinions on hunting and improving and developing. It's small stuff and relegated mostly to side content, but it adds so much more to these characters than the side cast of any other Monster Hunter game is given. Speaking of, the actual main story of Sunbreak does establish some layer and dimension for a couple of its characters. Bahari is kind of a goofball scientist who doesn't take things too seriously, loves what he does, and loves to prod and tease at his friends, though he knows how to reel things in and take things seriously when he needs to. Uh. <laughs> 
結構広いな<笑>ガランゴルムだひょっとしてスケットのハンターさんカムラの外から来た<笑>やっぱり<笑>俺はバハリモンスターの調査とものづくりのエキスパートだ拠点まで一緒に戻ろうと思ったがもうちょっとこの辺りを調べてからにするよテトコによろしく伝えといてくれるかいあったもう一つビオレーネにあったらさ再会を楽しみにしてるって伝えといて。Dr. Todori is a straight man foiled to Bahari who keeps a calm demeanor and is very well traveled, possessing knowledge about the myths and stories of the world. Yeah, I'm sorry. My name is Todori. I'm a doctor who is a doctor who is a doctor. I'm a doctor who is a doctor. I'm a doctor. これが終わりか始まりか。Even the quest receptionist, the, the girl who gives you your quests, Chiche, has dimension. She is the princess of the kingdom we're protecting. She gave up her royal privileges and put herself at risk and studied tirelessly to take on the responsibilities of a quest receptionist in order to be of some use, even refusing to be given special treatment from the other characters. Chiche Hime, Okoshi to a Shirazuni, Gobure. ダメですよ。私、ここでは受付嬢ですから。ですよね。She has this goofy little quirk where she'll say something stupid and then chastise herself under her own breath. She's got a lot of life to her. And then there's Admiral Gallius. Let's compare two characters real quick, and I'll show you why I think Sunbreak's story trounces rises. Elder Fugan and Admiral Gallius are the leaders of Kimura and Elgato, respectively. They are respected leaders in their communities, looked up to for guidance by their people. Fifty years ago, they both endured tragedy and witnessed destruction at the hands of core antagonistic forces in the game's stories. Fugan lost much of the old Kimura village and several people he knew to the Rampage and a Magnamalo. Gallius is one of the very Few survivors, maybe the only survivor of the Citadel being attacked by the affliction crazed monsters. Despite the cataclysm he has lived through, Fugan remains upbeat, optimistic, encouraging, fatherly, and boisterous. Gallius, despite the horrors he barely survived, is welcoming, humble, polite, stoic, composed, pragmatic, and in full control of his emotions without being callous. Pretty similar characters. Here's the core difference Fugan doesn't really get to do anything. He shows up at the end of a few quests, offers some encouragement, congratulates you for a job well done, and offers up his longsword to show a bit of a passing of the torch gesture perfectly fine. You know what he's about. Gallius gets the coolest cutscene in Monster Hunter. Gallius lost everything. To the Curio Affliction and its master, Geis Magorm, rose through the ranks of the military, learned to control his emotions, and got to look the maker of his pain in the eyes. Rolls up in a massive battleship, swoops in right as Geis Magorm makes its move to return to the surface, and you can see everything in just this facial expression. Oh, <laughs> Your character is a bystander to the best moment in the game. Even Bahari and Luchika, who are fairly minor characters, get their little moments of shine here. Because we know Gallius' history, and we know his character and personality, this moment works as a payoff. It makes sense for his character that he doesn't get Too emotional in this moment. He spent this story keeping things calm and cool at Elgato and keeping his subordinates reined in, but he let slip this expression of pure hatred. We know what this means to him, and yet he keeps the situation in hand, executes his part of the mission, and casts Geis Magorm down for Fia Rain and us to finish.
三番用意。機関逆進、完備中枢。Neither Fugin or Gallius change too much in the story. Both see the end of the horrible occurrences that took much from them in their past. But the difference is Gallius's involvement. He has his part to play in Geismagorm's death. His presence in the action adds a weight to this fight because we know what it means to him. It adds a sense of human drama that you don't get when you take down Magnamalo because it's just us taking taking him out in the woods. Fugin just gives us the quest and congratulates us when it's done. Gallius gets to be there, gets to look his enemy in the eye, gets to be the one who deals that blow. Our character has nothing. When we do these things by ourselves, there isn't that emotional impact, not really because there's no drama with us. Gallius and Geismagorm have that drama. And the best part of Ryze's story, the Narwa Nabushi stuff, that drama is predicated solely on their connection to each other, not their connection to any of the characters we're supposed to be connecting to. Let's talk about the stakes issue that Rise had. Sunbreak, though not presented particularly gritty, is allowed to stew in its darkness much more than Rise. Not to say that I want these games to take themselves too seriously, I don't, but both Rise and Sunbreak deal with heavy subject matter, legitimate threats to human civilization, trauma dating back decades, environments being ripped apart, animals and monsters being victimized, and the recurrence of these grim events potentially spelling doom for the present if action isn't taken. Rise has a very canned do attitude about all these obstacles in its way, and there is little actually shown about the potential dangers of the Rampage. Let's compare how the Rampage and the Curio are introduced. <laughs> ご近いうちに鳥で遠征することになるだろう。佐藤を守らねばならん。ご心配には及びません、佐藤さん。私たちカムラの民が日々修行を重ねてきたのは、まさにこの時のため。姉様、早速準備に取り掛かりましょう。<laughs> Rises is fine enough, has some somewhat ominous music, but it ends fairly light. With the curio. You watch an animal run for its life, get mauled to death, and get devoured by a swarm of parasites, while the characters can only just 
watch. The prelude to the battle with Geismagorm is one of the best quests Monster Hunter has ever had. An eerie, dark, dour, and hauntingly quiet mission to the Citadel where no monsters, not even any endemic life or spirit birds roam. Everything here is dead. Gradually, you come across the blood-drained corpses of several large, powerful monsters until you fight an infected Lunagaron. The music is a dull, ominous droning. There's no surge in the music, no crescendo, no energy, just nothing while you go through the motions of a fight. I've seen this quest compared to like a, a video game creepypasta and it's that's exactly what it feels like. I felt legitimately uneasy playing this quest and when the Lunagaron dies, it doesn't matter. The Kirio have what they want and it begins. <laughs> Kunigamidare Narwa and Ibushi are given seriousness and caution. Rise's story finally gets some of the tension it deserves once they come into play. The tension I think should have been present for the Rampage and Magnamalo. Guy's Magorm is given fear. The death of his rival Malzino returns full control of the Curio Swarm to its original master. We can merely watch as the affliction ravages the land unhindered, killing indiscriminately, devouring even the strongest and returning home to empower the archdemon of the abyss. The characters can only watch in terror as the land is immediately overwhelmed by a foe now wholly unchained. The ground cracks open, an old tower falls and a hellish red glow emerges from beneath the earth as an aberration slithers from the depths of the underworld to take his place on the surface, only to be cast down by the man from whom he took everything, and to be ultimately slain by the greatest warriors of Kimura and Elgato in single combat. The darkness and looming of ominous and sinister powers is felt. The emotions are built up to organically, and the people of Elgato get to be present and play their parts in events, not simply weigh in from the sidelines like they do in Rise. More than any other Monster Hunter story before it, I felt Wait here. I felt dread seeing an entire ecosystem littered with corpses. The developers succeeded in pulling emotions out of me here. And to stick with consequences and to dial things back a bit, characters actually get hurt. There's a cutscene where Malzino intercepts a Lunagron's body being carted away for research, displaying his intelligence by keeping the two fighters preoccupied, not even necessarily trying too hard to kill you, while allowing the Curio to drain the sustenance from the body of Lunagron. In the confrontation, he wounds Fiorain, and the blood blight toxins that enter her bloodstream damn near kill her. Not only is there a threat to an NPC that we care about here, but they do a cool job of incorporating the resulting quests into this part of the story. A lot of the in-between quests that introduce monsters can be fairly inconsequential, and most will explain that they need a certain monster part to build a device or something, but here, 
you save her life. You gotta go into the jungle to hope to find Dr. Tadori, which sparks the introduction of Astalos. And to create an antitoxin, you have to track down Espinas. This game even adds some extra weight to those filler quests in between the major plot points. Now, progressing to the very end of the story. I said that Fia Rain had a character arc in this game. I told you she's very by the book, very no nonsense when it comes to defending her home and will slay any monster that she perceives as a threat. A new Malzino rears its head after the events of the main story and appears to be yet another host of the Curio. She is determined to put this one down like the rest, but this Malzino is different. In what is some of the best storytelling through gameplay I've seen in this series, we see Malzino as he should be, bulkier, stronger, heftier, colored in brilliant silver, glittering golden regal blue, a knight of the forest. His form after the Curio symbiosis leaves him emaciated and mutated. This Malzino is not fully corrupted, but given time he will be. He not only fights you, but fights the infestation of parasites clawing at his hide and tearing at his mind, bolstering his powers and trying to turn him into a new dark lord. He fights for his mind, fights for his life, and in his desperation, Desperation displays utterly terrifying power, but it doesn't feel right to fight him. Fiorain and us the player can see this dragon's agony. Watch him be assailed on multiple fronts. Watch him battle the corruption that threatens to alter him like it has his kin before him. It feels rotten to face him, but for a moment he breaks away from it all and flees from both fights only for the Curio to hound him. Fiorain wanted to come here to slay Malzino, the one from the story nearly ended her life, acted as a host for the Curio for 50 years and is said to have caused tremendous damage and was a threat to her homeland. But she sees this and the species of Malzino for what they are, victimized creatures used for their power by these voracious, unyielding little demons. Though they too are animals, their life cycle perverts anything that it doesn't outright destroy. Fiorain recognizes the true villain here, and although in terms of gameplay you still do anomaly investigations and fight primordial mouse normally, I still like to think that this is the end that we cut the swarm down alongside this dragon who was our enemy, that we set this species of creature free, returned this dragon to his peace and quiet, gave him a chance to live again. And watching Malzino fly free and alive, Fear Rain sheds a tear, whether for joy or regret or apology or a mix of things, she goes from pure warrior to savior. Within the lore of Monster Hunter, Hunters, as well as the guild we serve, are meant to be wardens of nature and civilization, keepers of the peace, men and women who capture, redirect, and kill when necessary to cull threats to ecosystems and human settlements. Our rules are strict, our traditions are adhered to, our techniques are prized, our respect for the world around us is paramount. We are meant to trim the weeds and 
cuts sick branches in a way that is controlled, observed, and diligent. This is very hard to reflect in gameplay. We hunt these animals by the hundreds in game and theory craft their remains into min-maxed armor sets and bitch and moan when we can't get certain parts, even though the corpse is literally right there. I can see the wings. Why can't I just carve them? What do you mean 12%? The wing is f***ing gigantic. The games themselves do not reflect what our characters are supposed to be. And the plots of these games are usually to slay some grand new horror, not weed out a few wayward wyverns that stumbled onto a farm where they shouldn't be. But at the end of Sunbreak, we get to be that warden. The life cycle of the Curio is extremely hazardous to life around it. Guys Magorm is a legitimate threat to the ecosystems. They need to go. The Malzino species was forcibly mutated into blood-craving monsters. We get to save a species here. The saving of this animal changes a character's perspective on that animal. After so many years of these games, we fully get to see the fruits of our labor, the benefits of our guild. Sunbreak story is not prize winning. The dialogue can sometimes feel like a parody of how Royal Knights would talk. The main character, us, can only nod and grunt. The cutscenes are scattered and spattered across the game and broken up by several 20 to 30 minute hunts. It's not dense with the deepest and most compelling themes. Not every fight is weighty and impactful. And when you actually fight with NPCs, they machine gun off some really corny one-liners. But damn it, Capcom put in their best effort yet here. And I think they deserve some credit for that. They went back and retroactively added some extra characteristics to previous characters who were in a super plot-heavy story that didn't really serve them as characters very well. They created a multifaceted and likable cast who felt like they had a legitimate family dynamic and believable camaraderie. There were compelling payoffs to characters' histories, a touching arc, impactful involvement from secondary players in the narrative, and the best exploration into what the job of a hunter truly is. Guys Magorm is in the running for the most terrifying and well-built-up monster hunter villain in the franchise, and Malzino is a tragic antagonist with his own moments of intimidation and fear. Gallius' attack on Guys Magorm and the freeing of primordial Malzino will likely endure in our memories for a good long while, because these moments felt earned and substantive. Capcom more of this, please. I think a lot of us have written off that these stories will serve purely as function, and that is what they need to do. But more than any other Monster Hunter title before this, you can feel the effort and the care and passion for this world and these characters. Again, I don't want to promise anyone that they're going to be deeply and profoundly moved by Sunbreak's narrative, but I would say allow yourself to take it in. Let it tell you the story it wants to tell. The substance is there. And this is, I think, without a doubt, Monster Hunter's greatest story so far. And I hope it's outdone, again and again, because I really grew to care. The writers and performers and animators did their jobs pretty well. And that, I think, is the place I want to end it.
Yeah, there's other mechanics here and there, discussions to be had about performance and graphics and textures and color palettes and settings and menus and multiplayer and the ups and downs and pros and cons of so many other details within Rise. And they are worth discussing, absolutely. But I have said what I think I wanted to say, and I have celebrated in the way I wanted to celebrate. And I think it best to leave those other talking points to people who would find those aspects of reviewing and critiquing and loving a game as fascinating and intrinsic to their experiences as I do with the things I chose to speak of. Rise has more flaws to cover and other triumphs to acknowledge. The nitty-gritty of more technical aspects and infrastructure are another man's passion. I don't really consider myself a, quote, game reviewer, but I did review Monster Hunter Rise in a way, and I did it how I wanted to do it, and I loved every moment. I've had my gripes and my issues and my not-so-favorite mechanics and monsters here and there. I've had my story issues and my pacing issues and my complaints about the end game, but I still celebrate this game. I'm so glad to have experienced it and its maps and monsters and mechanics and characters and experiments and its successes and failures and its good and bad ideas. I'm ready to move on from Monster Hunter Rise. I do want a title that's a bit more weighty and hefty, but I still love Rise. I do not want it to be the model for every Monster Hunter out of it, but I still do love it. I love it as it is. It's been a pleasure to cover it in its final months before a new title eventually comes out, and it's been a joy to experience the end of its development here with this community. And of course, we still have a few more months before new and shiny saps our attention away, so whilst we still have Sunbreak in the forefront of our minds, let's enjoy it for a little while. I hope Rise is remembered fondly. I know it won't be by everyone, but once its place in the franchise is cemented, and once hopefully some new titles come in and establish their own feel, Monster Hunter Rise will be remembered as the wacky and crazy entry in the franchise that it is, bearing an identity that not everyone may love, but is intrinsically its own. This has been one of the toughest and most challenging scripts I have ever written. Constant reorganization and second-guessing and fact-checking and expanding and minimizing and compiling of thoughts to try and create a complete vision. And I'm satisfied with my work here. I'm sorry this video came out way later than I thought it would. Outside interference and the occasional bit of writer's block and, yes, a little bit of laziness here and there has probably made this my most difficult video so far. So thanks for the patience, and thanks for being here at the end. It means the world. If you enjoyed yourself, anything as simple as a like helps me and the channel out tremendously. And if you find yourself sticking around, consider subscribing. I want to hit 5,000 subscribers before my first full year on the platform. Five times what I hoped for when I began this journey. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to take it a little easy on the huge projects for most of the rest of the year, but stay tuned for December. I have plans for this holiday season. Big plans. This has been CR Volcanic or Connor. See you soon. Shoutout to all the patrons, and special shoutout to Nihilist Chimerax, Pico Plush, and Dapoy Doin' Da Ding. Thanks, guys.